And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Uh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there in the Ideas Room tonight already. And of course, I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, as part of our four-year uh, X-Series celebration, mm -hmm. we are, you know, last night we were deep, deep underwater mm -hmm. with Autech, and today we're going into space. Into the to the stars. <laughs> to the stars. Um, and this is very interesting because uh, the notion, of course, of the secret space program is something that we've covered extensively on this show. But um, the idea of a secret space government that creates that, that's something else again. And we're going to have to go deep in the history on that. And uh, deep, deep in there, of course, in the launch of this, the face of the entire operation right now is Elon Musk. And so Musk and Tesla and SpaceX becomes right at the core of this. And um, there's just a whole ton of ex steganography to explore on this one. And <laughs> you don't have to look for it when you get around Bezos. And when you get around Musk, the ex steganography is dripping off these guys because they are deep, deep into the X technology. Uh, we had a great show last night. And thank you for joining us for part one. Uh, last night and part two tonight of our four year anniversary of the X series. And um, it's been great, of course, having you uh, guys here supporting the show and getting behind us on all this and really rolling these ideas out. One of the things I pointed out last night was there's a series of concepts that have come out of the research for the show. And uh, we haven't even really released, I would say, three quarters of the information that's been gathered around this. But um, some remarkable things have happened. Um, you know, in 2018, when we came out with the Nixon Trump links, they weren't widely known at all. As a matter of fact, uh, people said that they didn't exist. And uh, we found out in the fall of 2020 that the Nixon Library released all that correspondence and showed those close, close ties. And that's what I mean in terms of dark journalism. When we get into ex steganography you're going to be able to find out things. And we together, you in the ideas room and, uh, you know, working together in tandem, we're going to find things out that we need to find out in advance and on a deep level and in a way uh, that it's not easily sort of brainwashed out of us, you know. Uh, so we're going to be able to get that information and then crystallize it, whether it relates to the mystery schools or the UFO file or the deep state uh, control over world events, which is what we're facing. And that's where the space part becomes uh, so crucial. And that's what we're going to get into tonight in X series X122 part two. And this one, of course, is the secret space government Elon Musk, UFOs, and emergency powers. Uh, emergency powers, that crucial, crucial piece that I want to really focus people in on because the last two years have been run largely on emergency powers. So we're living under the regime of emergency powers, and I don't see them giving up um, those powers, even though they loosen them here and there. The digital ID is a coming. So um, this is crucial because the UFO threat and the, the things they can do with space represent, or even with asteroids, uh, represent a level of threat emergency where they can seize power. And so we need to get a handle on what their activities are up there. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, tonight. Another thing I want to point out is in this massive kind of push around the Ukraine uh, war peace with Russia uh, invading Ukraine, um, you know, we're seeing something rather remarkable, which is there's no room for any analysis of the thing. It's just a one gung-ho piece about how, um, you know, Russia is the aggressor and, and Ukraine is heroic. Now, the people are caught in the middle, and it's the people on the ground uh, that we stand with on this, not the governments. And, you um, you know, so in terms of Russia's action, they were lured in there and they weren't getting the security assurances that they wanted uh, from the government of Ukraine. And behind that government of Ukraine is the World Economic Forum. Uh, and the CIA rolled in there. And if we look at the work of Professor Peter Dale Scott, he identified this very well about CIA interference in that society. And that interference is now... Uh, giving us this blowback of this war. And when you get into war situations, it can get very, very out of control. But there is an aerospace aspect to this. Believe it or not, there's a UFO 
piece that goes with it. And we're going to absorb and kind of go through some of these lines tonight and see what we come out with. So you can literally say last night in part one with the underwater piece, we got to look at what's going on underwater. Now we're going up into the low Earth orbit and beyond to see what kind of planetary control grid they're building for control on the ground. Um, and one of the things that I, I'd like to point out is, um, you know, what we're going to do is in the second half of the program, it, we're going to take your questions. You know, great questions last night. Unbelievable off the charts. Mm -hmm. But Olivia is putting those together now so you can ask away and we'll take them in the second half. Uh, before I launch into all this, how are we doing out there? Everybody is so grateful to have a double header tonight. <laughs> um, and I have a question already. Yes. Plato Always New wants to know, uh, has DJ invited Elon yet to the show? You know, uh, there were two people that I went behind the scenes to try to talk to, uh, and certainly Musk was one of them. Oddly enough, there's there's a channel to speak to Musk, potentially, and uh, I would love to uh, question him <laughs> on this program, and uh, he's invited here anytime. Uh, one of the interesting stories is about my outreach to um, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, who had come out promoting this UFO threat thing and was one of those I call the UFO neocon. And um, but they were very responsive at first when I asked them about uh, his position on the UFO issue and if we could speak to him. And then uh, they instantly turned the subject matter and said, what are you going to talk about? What are you going to ask him? And uh, I so I'm just looking for the truth on this. And so they figured it out pretty quick that uh, that wasn't going to be a good turn for them. And uh, they went off the, the radar really, really fast. But um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, threads that we have out there. But, you know, my feeling is anyone can come on this program who is working on that level, even people uh, that I've disagreed with heavily on this program. I even invited uh, Elizondo mm -hmm. to a gentleman's debate on this channel. But they... Um, you know, those types of people won't because um, if they're operating around certain scripts and talking points, then it's going to be hard. They're not going to get that sweet deal uh, that they get with some shows, you know. And uh, so, but nonetheless, the offer stands. And I think it would be beneficial all around if they're looking to get their message out. And I, I highly recommend that uh, we could have a really good conversation. <laughs> There's a lot of things about Musk. Uh, on that level, again, we're not really dealing with the individual anymore. And this is what you find out when you look into the past. I think part of me uh, studying Howard Hughes and all the power that was captured around you know, him being so rich and having so much government power and aerospace influence, that you realize the aerospace companies and the Central Intelligence Agency, the deep state, start to run the machine because... The person in the middle can't do anything without their help. So whoever it is inevitably ends up being a figurehead. And uh, that's crucial too. Also, there are certain distinct aspects of Musk in his bio that are going to help us uh, to really see what's going on there. Yeah, what do you got? Uh, Food Provider wants to know, uh, do we have a secret space program or are we hiding something else? <laughs> Uh, we have been working since 1972, which was the last um, moon landing, and that was uh, Apollo 17. It's going to come up here tonight, in fact. And then there's a 50-year gap. So here we are, 2022, 50 years ago is the last time we went to the moon. There's no explanation for that. The explanation is we've had a secret space program. <laughs> and um, what that program is for and who it's rebutting and challenging uh, and who's paying for it and where the money is coming from are the things that have been kept from the public. So one of the wonderful things that uh, Secretary Fitz, uh, when she comes on the program, has said is, um, you know, that's fine if they've gotten away with the missing trillions, but we want our stock certificate in those UFOs if that's what they've been building with it. And there's no question Lockheed Martin, Boeing, these are the guys that have been putting that together using those elements of the X technology that they have. The aerospace companies are the least investigated, uh, these defense contractors, the least investigated mainstream media. You see all kinds of intrigue about individuals. You see all kinds of deep dives on people, but the aerospace companies, you know, just hang out there in the middle, except in our coverage, which is very, very heavily centered on uh, Lockheed 
I did uh, a documentary now in 2020. I've got a new one coming up this summer. But in 2020, I did X Protect the UFO Aerospace Assassins. And that's crucial because it's got that history of how they got involved and um, some of the important pieces there. And a lot of that ties into the JFK history as well, because that's when that covert government that was operating side by side with the public overt government flipped. And when you had that flip, all sorts of things rippled out from that. So you get the Vietnam War, you get all these other pieces. Um, and that, you know, the space trajectory is set up by Kennedy. He, he invents the idea of peaceful exploration of space, all scientific exploration, no militarization of space puts it into the treaties. Those treaties get signed by his um, vice president. So, you know, it would have been a totally different approach. Now we have the militarization of space. Everybody's gung-ho about getting their weapons there and they're already there. So uh, that's a very dangerous situation. And stepping back from that and um, getting the precedent back to a peaceful exploration and no weapons policy in space, is crucial and it comes up tonight, but you know, the, the point I'm talking is kind of a sane, logical public debate level. They've done so much with the black budget and with the missing trillions that this conversation goes right off the rails uh, when we get into that. So we're gonna look at some of that tonight. I, what we need to do and what I've put together is a presidential thread because that's what leads up to Musk and uh, SpaceX and SpaceX utilization of, um, that position and all of the interesting, uh, you know, setup since the moon landing, those 50 years of the privatization of space using public money is how you get uh, figures like Branson and uh, Musk. But Musk in particular, they're pulling the old Howard Hughes trick with. And um, if he does stand up for himself, they'll, they'll pull the string. So that's something to watch for. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. We're here in part two of X-Series 122. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be taking your questions in the second part of the program. I want to remind you to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. And that's the thing that keeps us in touch uh, with each other, regardless of any social media censorship. We've seen quite a bit, <laughs> in fact, uh, and a lot of shadow banning as well. So, uh, and that's basically just a free newsletter, but it keeps us in touch and it lets you know what amazing interviews and uh, broadcasts, special broadcasts, even events that we have coming up. You want to be on there and uh, make sure to be counted. So go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for that newsletter. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that, um, you know, there's... There's going to be, uh, in relation to Ukraine, just like there was with the COVID op, so much censorship. And um, one of the things I want us to watch for just generally is the incredible dramatization of Zelensky as a hero fighting the bad guys and stuff. Um, you know, it's very important that we get the right perspectives on this. And that takes a whole a series of voices to get the correct idea. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned last night was a 2016 documentary that Oliver Stone did after a lot of research. And we know Stone is real good, uh, not just with Hollywood movies, but with documentaries, including the JFK Revisited uh, Through the Looking Glass, which is remarkable. And that also just came out part two of that. And I want to watch that. Um, I, I saw part one and I thought it was remarkable, but this Ukraine on fire is quite remarkable because um, it captures the situation before Zelensky and it was already being tampered with heavily by the Central Intelligence Agency. And another major source on this, uh, as I mentioned, is Professor Peter Dale Scott. When we get around that deep state, it's very hard to see our way around. And you're going to hear a lot of war drums on both sides. This is where the Democrats and the Republicans tend to get together, the Mitt Romneys. Uh, join arms with Hillary Clinton and go after Tulsi Gabbard, you know, and uh, Gabbard uh, is is interesting because uh, she's basically putting things out there like about the bio labs that the U.S. was setting up there in the Ukraine, and that doesn't go along with the narrative uh, very well. So, um, you know, you, you find that deep state coalescence of interest getting together and blasting anyone in their path, left or right. 
And um, it's funny because the Democrats find out pretty quick, it doesn't matter. <laughs> These people, there's no loyalty. Um, and this works also on race and politics issues and gender issues, anything else. Anyone who doesn't go along with the machine is, uh, you know, to be stamped out. And they've done a lot of that, for example, with Candace Owens, who is also somebody who's calling out a number of things about her policies over there. And you find the same people who are, you know, on a hair trigger about any uh, thing relating to race or gender. I and mean, she's, you know, both a woman and black. Um, you know, those same people who are always watching for this kind of stuff, oh, they're instantly dismissing her and saying like, oh, you know, she's fascist and all this stuff because she has an opinion that doesn't go along with them. So they don't have any real loyalty. All they want is uh, a lot of that posturing and virtue signaling and the wokeism as a cover to go in and basically loot the treasury and loot other countries and all the rest. And um, so the, the central intelligence piece is crucial for us to understand in relation to space. And that's what we're gonna get into tonight. Before I jump into it, Miss Olivia, you're up. Um, Beth Luca Henson wants to know, or sorry, Beth Luce Henson, uh, if we went to the moon in the 60s, why haven't we been back? That's really the question. And, um, you know, the Apollo program starts with so much uh, ambition. It's Kennedy's program and it gets, you know, he wants to put someone on the moon before the end of the decade, the 1960s. That's a really heavy duty request at the time. They had to catch up fast. Uh, but then Kennedy wanted to share that. He wanted a joint moon mission with the Soviets. And that is confirmed by Khrushchev's son, who said in those back channel communications, this is exactly what they were setting up. And Kennedy's relationship with Khrushchev um, becomes very important when we speak about this tonight, because what they started to do at this period of time, the Central Intelligence Agency and the ex-protect groups inside the aerospace corridor of the intelligence wing, um, they started to prevent the president's from meeting with their counterparts in other countries in a way that couldn't be manipulated. So they'd always want the State Department between them. They'd always want the CIA between them, whatever it happened to be. They never want those guys to get together because they don't want them to discuss the UFO file and decide on a new policy because that's their purview. They've taken over the X technology. Um, so you found that Kennedy, you know, stressed this, that he didn't want other people. He didn't want CIA advisors, State Department people there with him. He wanted to talk one-on-one -on -one with Khrushchev, even though Khrushchev was an incredibly hard uh, personality to deal with. And this piece with Russia gets to uh, not only the history of things, but what we're facing right now in relation to this. But I think Kennedy's really a great lesson uh, for us on this. And Kennedy is trying here to kind of put forward to Khrushchev, who is a real <laughs> piece of work, very hard to deal with. And, you know, is saying, we'll bury you and all that stuff. But Kennedy says, look, it's in both of our best interest, not only to reduce nuclear tensions, but I'm, I want to do a joint space mission with you. I don't want a space race. I don't want arms in space. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to uh, share aspects of the UFO file with you. This is what he comes to Khrushchev with, and elements in our national security state hit the roof. But um, so after this, whenever the presidents decide they're going to get together with their Soviet counterparts, there's always this hassle. And we've seen it. Uh, we saw it with Trump and uh, the CIA preventing that because they didn't want Putin and Trump to meet to talk about the UFO file. The same thing happened with Gorbachev and Reagan. Gorbachev gets Reagan alone and they talk about what? Well, years later, Gorbachev reveals they talked about the UFO file in a very frank fashion. And when he reveals it, you know, he's talking to a pre-scandal Charlie Rose, and in the audience are people like Kissinger and all these other major national security figures, George Shultz, and they cannot believe they are dropping their jaws that Gorbachev is letting this stuff out. But he feels that it's important, obviously. And what's interesting is he actually apologizes uh, to the audience and to the people assembled for bringing it up. But he's like, you know, this is what happened. And uh, this is during the Reykjavik summit. Reykjavik becomes very important because at the time it's seen as a massive failure. It's a summit that takes place between uh, Reagan and Gorbachev in Iceland. And um, 
Reagan at a certain point is like, I want all the staffers out. I want everybody out. I just want to talk to Gorbachev alone with an interpreter and that's it. And they have, they break away. And again, the CIA hits the roof, that national security state hits the roof because, you know, if they get together and discuss these things, watch out. So there's a little bit of a setup with this because just before uh, Gorbachev gets in, there was someone else in there and he was the head of the KGB and his name is Yuri Andropov. This guy is not very well uh, sort of examined by the UFO people. They're too busy running around after <laughs> CIA jokers. They should be studying Andropov because Andropov put out the word that he wanted all of the UFO files to be centrally managed in the Soviet Union. And he had an incredible understanding of what was going on there. But the Soviets and the Americans had such an incredible standoff. It was very much, uh, you know, like now, now is even worse, but um, there was a major standoff and they weren't meeting at the time. Sound familiar? Well, um, interestingly enough, Reagan understood the UFO file aspect and he found someone in Andropov who also was open to this. Here is uh, an article detailing uh, Andropov's knowledge. KG, KGB chief ordered 4 million soldiers to keep watching the skies for UFOs. Yuri Andropov, the former Soviet leader and longtime head of the KGB, had an acute personal interest in UFOs and ordered a 13-year program that required every soldier in the military to monitor sightings over Russian territory, according to new revelations. So this is part of that wave of information that came out of records out of Russia relating to the former Soviet Union. And Andropov uh, shunned the splendor enjoyed by many Soviet leaders to live in a sparse flat throughout his 15 years as KGB chief. And then he became secretary general before uh, Gorbachev. But he, um, he had a whole program about how to manage the UFO file piece. So this is the 20 year effect post JFK. This is their response to it. You know, this is what JFK tried to get started. Again, JFK, um, one of the crucial things about his presidency is he's so far <laughs> ahead. And this is something that Mikhail Gorbachev, who actually went to the Texas School Book Depository, which is supposedly where Kennedy was shot from. We know he wasn't, but in history, they, they say that Oswald shot from that window, which is ridiculous. But nonetheless, you know, they have the museum there and all the rest. And Gorbachev went there to the site of the assassination to give a speech. And he said, fundamentally, uh, JFK was so far ahead in terms of geopolitics and forward thinking and freedom loving that the world just hadn't caught, and they still haven't caught up uh, to his vision of free nations. So this is a lot of the problem, which is Kennedy is operating amidst this very dinosaur machine, which is trying to consolidate humanity. And he's bringing in these ideas of freedom. And he, when he gets around the UFO file, he realizes the sensitivity because he was uh, Forrestal's friend and Forrestal was the first defense secretary, as we know, and he got thrown out of the window at Bethesda Naval Hospital because he was another one who on the X-share side, this other side of the fence, aside from X-Protect, who wants to lock that information up, there's a group inside that national security wing that wants to move the culture forward. And very a lot of them, a lot of their members have been bumped off. And certainly he's one of the very high level uh, figures, the first defense secretary and also the head of Dylan Reed, the head of the Navy at a certain point. And uh, I have some interesting revelations about Forrestal that kind of relate to this episode, but I'll probably save them for another episode. Um, but here's an interesting piece on that that I think is crucial. And again, the tension going on uh, with the Soviets threatening nuclear war and all these types of things. You know, Kennedy faced that down and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, created the framework over 13 days where they could take their missiles back and nobody would fire a shot uh, and save the world from nuclear con conflagration. This is important because we don't hear about any kinds of real negotiations now. We just hear bellicose rhetoric and, uh, you know, we hear the New World Order people just licking their chops at the idea of luring Russia into making mistakes. So um, what we need is a real uh, 
steady program of getting everyone to step back from that Ukraine, Russia, and the whole bit and giving Russia those security assurances that we're not going to put NATO on their doorstep. Of course, you know, the a lot of the genies out of the bottle with this war already, but that's the program that they need to get on, I think, to set these things back. Um, this is interesting, though, because um, Forrestal, who was the defense secretary, who is key in the original uh, UFO file discussions, especially around um, Roswell and these other incidents, he has a totally different take on how the Truman administration should approach this. He thinks that they should share it with the public and that the public would be able to absorb it. And the idea is that the people in X-Protect basically form the Central Intelligence Agency. And that whole thing all happens in 47. And ever since, we've had a lot of problems, frankly. But these are some of the impressions of John F. Kennedy exploring the ruins of Berlin post-war, going over there with his friend, Forrestal. It's quite interesting. Quote, the devastation is complete uh, and the streets are relatively clear, but there's not a single building which is not gutted. Think about that. That's where they want to take us now. Remember, you know, look at Syria. How did that place look when they got out of there? I mean, it's a disaster. On some of the streets, the stench, sweet and sickish from dead bodies is overwhelming. It's pretty harsh. The people will have completely colorless faces, the yellow tinge and pale tan lips. They are all carrying bundles. Where are they going? No one seems to know. I wonder whether they do. Here we get some of the deep thinking of JFK on this. They sleep in cellars. The women will do anything for food. One or two of the women wore lipstick, but most seem to be trying to make themselves as unobtrusive as possible to escape the notion of the Russians. The Russians were short, stocky, and dour looking. Their features were heavy and their uniforms dirty. They were occupying Berlin at this period. Hitler's Reich Chancellery was a shell. The walls were chipped and scarred by bullets, showing the terrible fight which took place at the time of its fall. Hitler's air raid shelter was about 120 feet down into the ground, well furnished but completely devastated. The room where Hitler was supposed to have met his death showed scorched walls and traces of fire. There's no complete evidence, however, that the body that was found was Hitler's body. The Russians doubt that he is dead. It's very interesting. Now, when this was happening, of course, a lot of people were aware that Hitler didn't die there in the bunker and that the second wing of the Nazis going over to Argentina, which they'd been setting up as a backup option just in case things didn't go too well, um, that a big part of their command structure just landed back over there. And the scientists we were able to get our hands on and took over here to America during Operation Paperclip have uh, that wonderful advantage of gaining anonymity when they were here. So a lot of them just blended right into the scenery, universities and everything else, and nobody questioned their background. The others who were high profile needed a major, major campaign around their image. So von Braun and people of this ilk uh, would be hailed as heroes and become the father of our space program. But we have to remember that their heads were still in that Nazi dictation and they were in that ideology of the Aryan supremacy and, and all the rest. So when we see a lot of the push pull around the space program and we see that when Kennedy wants to share the knowledge about the UFO file with the Soviets, that this is what sets up many of the conditions for the assassination. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist program. It's great to have everyone here for part two of our four-year uh, celebration of the X series. And um, thank you so much for helping us to uh, bring these shows to you. We really appreciate it. And it's great to have so many of you here tonight. Uh, we're going deep into the space realm on this and uh, through the figure of Elon Musk. And how did Musk get to be Musk after all? His bio is going to come up here shortly, and it's very interesting, including some of those key connections. Uh, of course, a little sneak preview. One of them is the same one we were covering last night, uh, Miss Ghislaine Maxwell. 
And uh, some of the interesting back and forth in steganography that's been taking place between them recently is going to really astound you. And I'd like, uh, I have certain interpretations around it, but I'm very interested to hear yours as well. We're going to be taking your questions in uh, the second part of the program. So you can give those to Miss Olivia now. And I know there's already some good ones going on. Great questions last night. Uh, what's going on out there? It is a wacky night. <laughs> Saturdays are always wacky in the <laughs> ideas room. They're just rollicking. Okay. <laughs> I like that, actually. Saturday is always a little bit offbeat. It's true. Friday night is the night of the X series, and then Saturday is like anybody's game. Um, but I see a lot of familiar faces out there, and it's great to see everyone. Um, one thing I want to stress is this presidential piece is crucial because it's it's been happening. And then with Biden, they sort of don't need to do it because Stepford Biden is under committee control. So him getting in there and meeting with the world's you know, leader doesn't really mean anything because it's that committee behind him. And they've been trying to do things like take the nuclear football away from uh, good old Stepford Joe. And uh, so we'll see, we'll see how far that gets. So really the last person that the CIA was blocking in terms of these summits and things uh, was Trump. If someone else gets in after Biden who wants to open up this thing again, the CIA will go into that whole routine about, oh, you know, you're a Russian traitor and all the rest of it so they can prevent these people from meeting. Uh, this is what was happening now. The major publications were putting out this type of stuff when Trump was trying to meet with Putin in 2018. The Trump-Putin summit made a mockery of public diplomacy. The Russian may at least have projected strength, but the American delivered a dangerous muddle. This was the stuff that they did. And when Trump said, I'm going to meet with Putin on my own, with no CIA, State Department people, all the media, MSNBC and everyone else was like, oh, you're Putin's puppet. You know, and the Democrats launched an impeachment and all this nonsense. It all came to nothing and it was all lies. And the people who were on that side of the fence need to admit it <laughs> because we need to get the conversation back to normal again where people don't just say things, uh, you know. And um, so the whole four years that Trump was in office, the CIA was trying to get him out <laughs> and they had a lot of help from the DNC. Wherever you fall, in the political spectrum, it's not right for the CIA to control the White House. That's the point. And uh, the CIA, of course, is an extra constitutional agency set up with Gestapo-like powers, which have nothing to do with American democracy. So we're, we're in a problem there. And they have continued and grown. And whenever they've been challenged, Kennedy's era, uh, even Carter had a major challenge for them. Trump, whenever they get challenged, they get pushed back a little bit. The 70s hearings, you know, the 80s hearings, the uh, hearings about torture. And, you know, eventually uh, the person who headed up the torture unit, Bloody Gina, uh, Gina became, Gina Haspel was our CIA director. <laughs> so you get rewarded for this over the top activity. So there's a big problem there. There's a gigantic need of massive deep state reform, and you just have to kind of take those officials and uh, put them through those legal, uh, really hardcore means. Because um, the problem right now is that the CIA has control over the media. They have control over these global situations. They can suck you in. Um, you know, they can tamper with things in terms of what's going on and what happened in Wuhan. They can tamper with the information given to the president on that. They can tamper with the situation going into the Ukraine and forcing all of these dynamics. So they're running away with our lives, in fact. So if we don't get some control over that agency and the deep state that it's connected to, then we're gonna just be dealing with this, you know, more pandemics, more wars and all the rest of the nonsense. And I think we can lay um, the majority of this on these secret institutions because when things are out and they're discussed, which of course they try to stop so much in social media, then um, it, it has a different perspective. The public is support isn't there for them. And so what they do, um, these groups, these leadership groups, just like Biden came in and didn't have a majority support. Uh, let's face it, you know, that election was very, very funky. And uh, that's being polite. But uh, there's somebody who comes in with practically no mandate. And, you know, his poll numbers are like 27%. Justin Trudeau in Canada 
you know, his group, the liberal group that wins, doesn't win a majority. They win 31 percent. You know, they get just enough to become leaders and do that. So these people don't have the actual mandates to run these countries. What they have is the ability, once they get into this minority position, to press the emergency button. Because when they press the emergency button, their powers are unlimited. You have to stay in your house. You have to mandate this to get a job. Uh, you have to wear a mask to go to a gas station. I mean, it's ridiculous. But those are the emergency powers. Now, that's one aspect of it that we've been through in the past couple of years. They try to roll out a number of things during Homeland Security. They had all kinds of, uh, as you remember, terror drills and the TSA, you know, grabbing your kids, looking for weapons <laughs> and things like that. So we've been through a kind of a social conditioning around this. The emergency powers shift when it gets to space and a space emergency. That's very dangerous because then it becomes unlimited global emergency powers for a very small group. And that's what we can avoid um, if we really understand the dynamics that are going on behind it. And that's where the emergency powers conversation comes in so handy. Okay, um, I'm glad I have some caffeine for tonight because we have a lot to get into. Um, I want to um, get into this presidential piece a little bit and then we're going to jump into Musk. And uh, we're doing good on time right now. Uh, and so we'll, we'll take your questions in about an hour, I would say. All right, so this is an important um, moment that took place in 1962. Um, and basically, um, what had happened, I'm sorry, 1961, what had happened was uh, Alan Dulles, who was the CIA director here, had tried to lure President Kennedy into a war in Cuba by basically saying, oh, we're too deep in with the Bay of Pigs operation and um, putting in an invasion force into Cuba without... Kennedy's authorization. And Kennedy was, they thought, young enough and would be swayed by this older man. This is the profile that they whipped up um, under Corson, which is a very interesting uh, individual who was around all of these activities. And um, the profile that they set up there, they underestimated Kennedy's independence when he went into office. They thought he's younger, he'll take advice from this guy who's been part of the national security establishment. Dulles was um, freaked out that Kennedy had this independent streak. He thought he was going to be able to manipulate him as he did Eisenhower because Eisenhower in the, especially the second term was, had had a stroke and was getting older and was sort of more easily manipulated. Uh, although he himself at the end of his presidency said, beware of the military industrial complex because he understood that. He'd been part of that machine his whole life. So uh, his bravery shone through. But the thing is with Kennedy, they underestimated him in a few fronts. He had his own deep state connections. He had his own ways of navigating. And so therefore, um, they underestimated his sense of intelligence and independence. So what happens is uh, Kennedy says, you know, after the Bay of Pigs incident, look, if this were... England, I'd have to go. But because this is America, you have to go. And he fires, you know, the idea of firing um, Dulles is kind of like firing Fauci. <laughs> it's just like this position where he's been in for so long. And, you know, he created the CIA and his brother had been secretary of state and he'd been running the CIA since 1953. But right there standing next to him is Richard Bissell. And Richard Bissell is this very strange um, figure. It's a very imposing figure. He's six foot eight. But um, Bissell has become very uh, interested and has been setting up all of the things around Project Blue Book and all of the alien uh, aspect and all the UFO file research. What he's done is set up these satellites that can look out into space and simultaneously down at the Soviet Union. So those satellites and that whole system of satellites now has a dual purpose. They are looking out uh, to potential enemies <laughs> in space and also here. And so Kennedy gets wind of this and he starts to examine how much they know about the UFO file versus what the president knows. 
And this sets up more of these dynamics of these people having the information. So at one point in, during his presidency, uh, Kennedy asked the CIA to give him all the high threat cases involving UFO incidents because he wants to share those with our Russian counterparts. And these documents are actually available um, at the Kennedy Library about cooperation in space. Uh, and then a memo also got out that was authenticated um, dealing with the same subject, and it's dated November 12th. So um, the cooperation that Kennedy was looking for, he was saying, look, we're the two most powerful uh, groups in the world. We're running the world, and we can't afford to have any situation come up where there's a nuclear exchange because we've had a misunderstanding or we haven't communicated properly. And uh, he wants to bring the UFO part into that because he's like, if a UFO goes over one of your nuclear bases, he wants to share that information with them. So the groups inside of the Central Intelligence Agency who have been grooming this whole UFO file deception, they don't want to share any of that information. And so they're really ticked off that Kennedy knows about this, first of all, and that he's demanding this information from them. This is the big push-pull that we've seen. It took place uh, under the Nixon administration, under the Carter administration, under the Reagan administration, and not under the Bush administration, not under the Clinton administration, but it comes back around uh, again when Trump gets into office. There's this push-pull between those who have the UFO file knowledge and the president office who has the authority to take that information under the executive wing. And this is the battle that we're seeing playing out in all of these private space operations. And it's playing out in a heavy way in relation to the war aspects, because there's a major aerospace piece in relation uh, to this war piece. So let's just reflect on a couple of the presidential uh, tension pieces on this, because I think it's going to take us somewhere. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. Uh, this is part two of X. 122, and we're going deep here on the secret space government. Yes, government, the SSG. We know about the SSP. Well, the SSG is a major aspect of this. Uh, and of course, we funded it. So we have the right actually to know all about it. And we're going to see just how far uh, they've gone with this. And people like Obama and uh, former President Obama and um, Trump and others are going to play some very interesting starring roles in this. All right. Um, so the Space Force, what is Trump's Space Force and what does it mean for NASA? This was something that came up when Trump announced, hey, we're doing the Space Force and we're going to have it as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. This is interesting. Mm. It's the first time now that we had a new armed services branch in 60, 70 years. So this was a huge um, switch, change. For Trump to have done this meant that he came in armed with the idea because it's not the kind of thing you just spontaneously think about and you get to rifle through. You've got to set up the background on it. And from people I know who had some kind of background in politics, they were amazed at how fast Trump was able to get the Space Force done. But the Space Force um, was designed to get that UFO file back under presidential control. The thinking was on Trump's side that if you can get an actual armed services branch that controls things relating to space and the threats thereof, then you'll be able to get tap into all the intelligence that's been collected in relation to these types of anomalies uh, for scientific intelligence and defense purposes. So the space fence, uh, the Space Force comes out of that. Now what's interesting is it seemed to have caught a lot of people off guard, especially a group that was attempting to come in from the CIA side and make public certain types of UFO information in order to create a UAP threat group inside the national defense uh, state. So um, this is the push-pull, and we've seen that push-pull. We still have people uh, who have spun out of that, like Elizondo, that are still there on the public scene, and we just can't seem to, like, shake them off, right? Um, but it's very interesting to me because one of the things that has come out of this is something we've reported on here, which is this unlikely alliance between... Marco Rubio 
the Republican and Kirsten Gillibrand, the senator from New York, who's a Democrat, Rubio being a Republican, neocon, and they are like this for this new UFO office, the ASRO. Now, um, long story short, basically this is a, a very, I just call it a UFO neocon office. <laughs> And what they want to do is just create a defense UFO threat and then get funding as a result of it. So this is urgent. Bipartisan proposal for UFO office pushes new boundaries. Kirsten Gillibrand says in an exclusive interview. Now, Gillibrand is very interesting. I did an episode that incorporated her family's ties into the Nexum uh, cult. And uh, that's the cult with Keith Rainier where they did the bizarre sex antics and they drew in some really heavy duty, um, wealthy <laughs> people uh, from Canada and powerful families. And uh, they also drew in, you know, like an actress from Smallville and all these various Hollywood types. Gillibrand, uh, is, that question is still hanging out there. She actually ran for president in 2020. So to see her heading up this UFO effort is disturbing right off the bat. But it's been asked in major publications, and this one, what is Gillibrand hiding about her relationship with the Nexium sex cult? It has come up over and over again, and there's no good answer because her husband uh, was a lawyer for them, and his family was involved with them, and they leave the question open, what about her and Nexium? Well, you know, she claims that she wasn't involved, but... Um, you know, there's a lot of material there for blackmail if you're the national security state and you have this person running the UFO file, just like with Rubio and all of the weird bathhouse stories about him. It's pretty easy to take someone like that and manipulate them. Now, Rubio is playing a starring role as a neocon on the Ukraine issue saying, you know, we need to get America more fully involved. And, um, what I think is important for us to keep in mind is any heavier involvement is just a signal for escalating war and Russia is a nuclear armed country and the Ukraine is not our top priority on a foreign policy basis, although we've put them in a bad spot by promoting the idea that we would place NATO in there. It didn't happen, but just the promotion of that idea has put the whole thing in this tinderbox. And what the World Economic Forum is trying to do is gain from that, gain from this idea of war and, you know, Russia bad and Zelensky hero and all that. That's all the Davos crowd promoting the deep state agenda. It has nothing to do with what's good for the people on the ground. And uh, so when we see these neocons asking for no-fly zones and things like that, those are basically suicide missions for the people on the ground and for our own uh, troops, really just not the way to go. Um, so now here's a few things about Rubio, and this gets us into some interesting territory. The secret CIA training program in Ukraine helped Kiev prepare for Russian invasion. Um, so this is the story that's out now. Actually, interestingly enough, Yahoo News has it, and you don't expect them to have these kinds of stories, but they got their hands on this one. Uh, now, the Ukrainian snipers had a problem. Russian forces in eastern Ukraine were trying to blind them. As the Ukrainians were looking through their scopes in order to find their targets, the Russians had begun pinpointing their locations. The two sides were squaring off closely in close proximity in early 2014. The CIA uh, came in there and helped a whole coup happen in relation to the leadership in 2014. And that was another interfering with what was going on in that country. The Zelensky election is also interference in that country. So um, the CIA has, since its inception, been geniuses at overthrowing leaders, trying to get leaders that are favorable to us. And they have a terrible track record through Central America, Iran, the Middle East. You know, it's just, it's an incredible track record <laughs> of representing corporate deep state interests over American foreign policy interests and getting us into all kinds of wars, including the Iraq war, where George Tenet, the CIA director said, hey, it's a slam dunk. There's WMDs in there. Uh, and also the Vietnam War, where the Gulf of Tonkin incident didn't really happen, but they made it seem like they were under attack. And um, so they were able to create these fog of war situations. 
and the armaments industries grew and the power of the Central Intelligence Agency grew as a result. So along the lines, there have been really big interruptions in that CIA policy, and JFK certainly was one of them. What they're trying to do here, they've had it in place for such a long time that they were um, wanting to create a situation in Ukraine where they basically could place NATO right at the doorstep of Russia. And this is something that during the meetings about the reunification of Germany in 1990 between Gorbachev and Bush one, Bush one said, I'd like to be able to do this. And to everyone's surprise, Gorbachev said, yes, you, you can reunify East Germany with West Germany. I won't have any disagreement on that, even though, you know, the Russians gave up 20 million guys to <laughs> defeat Germany back during World War II. But he said, what I need from you is your assurance that you'll never grow NATO eastward. And we have. So we violated our promise in relation to that. And then this was coming up closer in relation to the Ukraine issue. So this is a very important backdrop to understand the, the foreign policy, the dire foreign policy issues that are involved. But when we get the space part included, then we know that we're in very, very deep a dicey territory. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Whew, X Series 122 Part 2. It's off with a bang. This is the background that we need in order to understand the national security state aspect in relation to the UFO file. We're going to be taking your questions in the second half of the program coming up. And before I launch into Section 2, what do you got over there? Um, David Allen wants to know, does DJ have an opinion on the reports of UFOs attacking the Russian army? Yes, you know, I have I have some of those reports here. And uh, I think they are significant because uh, I'm going to I'm going to roll those out as we get along. I want to point out something that I noticed right off the bat in relation to this war. Two things came up immediately. One of them was Chernobyl, which is very odd. Anyone uh, who looks back on that history or lived through it in 1986, there was a massive meltdown of a nuclear um, plant and it was a uranium processing plant and there's massive death and radiation uh, from that. And they thought that that kind of nuclear cloud was gonna go across Europe and cause all these incidents. And it certainly um, has had a dramatic, and I mean a dramatic impact on the health of the people in that region. So Chernobyl was decommissioned and all the rest, and they kept it as kind of, they didn't really say what was going on there, um, but they were able to get it going, <laughs> again, not as a nuclear reactor, but using it for different types of projects. Um, and there could be some kind of a tie in there about alternative energy and very unusual experiments regarding radiation. But whatever it was, people had forgotten so heavily about Chernobyl. For it to come up as a major point in this war was bizarre because it's not the key nuclear plant or anything like that. But all these stories started to come up. Chernobyl experts say Russia could set off a nuclear disaster with Chernobyl. And um, so Chernobyl instantly became the centerpiece. The second centerpiece was about a very unusual uh, UFO incident that took place in 1989 that in the Voronezh uh, reason, a region of Russia. And Voronezh is always a very strange case because it came over via TASS, the news agency, from Russia, and it just was like two UFOs landed. This is what happened. These aliens came out. They interacted with the public. In one case, they fired lights at them, and one of the people disappeared and reappeared somewhere else. And that, you know, police were called in, soldiers were called in. They interviewed the police captain. Um, so it was a very unusual case. Well, right off the bat, on like the second day of this war, uh, we had a weird incident of a high-performance military jet from the Russians going down in Voronezh, suspiciously, unusually, and it splashed across all these headlines. So all of a sudden, we had these two heavy-duty 1980s headlines in relation to this war, Voronezh, a major UFO incident, and Chernobyl, a massive nuclear meltdown, which threatened, you know, the entire, uh, you know, Europe in its entirety and Central Asia and all the rest. 
So um, there's something strange about it. And as soon as it, it came as to be kind of a focus of the war, instantly the Russian information around it became classified. Um, so there's something very odd about Chernobyl and I'm going to kind of track back on something in relation to Maxwell and Musk. So <laughs> we're going to see how those things play out. But the, uh, the Voronezh piece I think is dramatic and um, some of the drawings of these aliens landing in this park, I mean, this story, there are witnesses stretched out across decades who still talk about this incident. And uh, there's no question that the incident took place, was witnessed by a number of people. You can say maybe it was military mind control experiment, but whatever it was, it happened. And for Russia, it's kind of like their version of the Phoenix Lights, but with actual aliens running around. So um, a lot of wars and, um, you know, major changes in policy that come out of the deep state have a lot of signatures in relation to them, uh, just as COVID did in the financial crisis before that 9-11. They have these interesting signatures. And this one, uh, for me, Voronezh and Chernobyl, you have to read those tea leaves because there's something major going on in those things being the central headlines around this. Uh, so I think it does, it does, um, get us into a place where we have to look a little bit deeper. Okay, now let's get into Musk and then go back to the presidential level. Here's some odd things. They're positioning Musk as the head of a space government that technically, constitutionally, and on record doesn't exist, but they need the setup to create it. So one of the things that happened was uh, during the first week of the Ukraine war, Musk offered the leader of the Ukraine uh, to give him Starlink satellites so he could keep his internet up and running just in case the Russians shut it off. And they started to do the whole thank you, <laughs> Mr. Space President type thing. That's okay, Mr. President. So then we saw some odd headlines like this. Um, Musk challenges Putin to single combat over war in Ukraine. Now, um, this is very odd Hunger Games type stuff that was going on there and why he's inserting himself as a central figure in a war when he's just the head of some corporation doesn't make any sense unless a whole different government style is coming about. Um, we've caught, talked about the central uh, idea of the secret space program and how it relates to continuity of government. We need to keep those pieces in mind. Remember, none of this can be set up without an emergency. All right, uh, Elon Musk has challenged President Putin single combat fight over Russia's war in Ukraine. Absolutely absurd, right? All right, well, let's go into something that has some more bearing on this war and is actually an active war. Elon Musk's satellites help Zelensky dominate the skies. U.S. billionaire's internet system is allowing Ukrainian drones to pound Putin's helpless tanks. In other words, this company is reaching into the middle of a conflict and supporting one side. Um, so it's setting itself up also as a target. So now in relation to this, Russia could theoretically start shooting down SpaceX satellites, for example. The Starlink satellites. Uh, the Starlink satellites are also unusual in that there were a lot of astronomers and scientific uh, minds that were very concerned about this incredible explosion of these satellites everywhere, blocking out sunlight, uh, blocking out the stars and all the rest. And then this got big, you know, major green lights. And we have these satellites all over the place. This is part of the space control grid in the lower Earth orbit, controlling things on the ground. It's also the setup for driverless cars and, you know, the whole driverless truck <laughs> thing. So don't think, you know, these trucker convoys, they give them a lot of uh, attention and they're trying to kind of build those things into negative attention. So we need to kind of keep our eye on the ball about wh where are these things leading? But let's go into this article a little bit because it's quite fascinating. Uh, 
Aerial reconnaissance is being used to attack Russian drones and target Vladimir Putin's army of tanks with the help of newly available Starlink system, which improves internet and connection speeds. U.S. billionaire Elon Musk's new technology helps to keep Ukrainian drones connected with their bases. It comes as the country has continued to suffer through internet and power outages. Now, this is an escalatory move, and the Russians are looking at this major American company and saying, oh, they're helping the, the Ukrainians. We know that the United States is arming the Ukrainians, but now we have this whole other piece. It comes as the country has continued to suffer, uh, right, the Starlink app is the most downloaded in Ukraine, global downloads tripling the last two weeks. Elon Musk's Starlink satellite system is giving Ukrainian forces the edge in winning the drone war as the nation fights back with technology to track down invading Russians. So what it is basically now, SpaceX has become a military company and they've become a military threat to Russia. So we're setting up here the types of things that will allow you to get into this whole space government idea. And so you're going to be able to say, just like, you know, they were getting this assistance out of nowhere and Zelensky wasn't thanking the United States for their help. He was thanking Musk, saying thank you. Uh, SpaceX for your help. This is like a salute to the space governor, the space president. Um, but nobody elected this guy. This is just a corporation. And, you know, they're assuming this central role in the outcome of a war that doesn't necessarily have America's interests at all involved. So um, it's a major escalatory problem. The question is, what are they setting up with this? And what is Starlink doing in the middle of a war? This is the question that we're going to answer. Um, but I think that we have to look at these head fakes of Musk assuming this role that he's, you know, setting things out, setting things right in the world by making sure that Zelensky, the World Economic Forum hero, actor, leader of Ukraine, is, uh, you know, getting this incredible internet connectivity. And they're not just saying, hey, it's going to help humanitarian wise, etc. They're saying, he, we're going to track Russian soldiers with it and pinpoint them and blow them up. I mean, so it's, it's an act of war. Um, now, remember, the people that we have swimming around the UFO file, UFO threat pieces, they are neocons. They want war with Russia via the Ukraine. They want no fly zones. And Rubio comes under that neocon heading and he's deep, deep now in the UFO file piece with Gillibrand. All right. Ukraine-Russia conflict could derail global aerospace. There's a lot of interesting points coming out in articles like this. They're basically saying that the titanium that's required, um, and that's so central to this area, is going to set back all of the aerospace efforts. Now, um, one thing I want to mention is that Mike Pence, who was the VP under Trump, when he set up all of his moon missions, he was like, we're doing it in 2025 and, you know, win, lose or draw, we're going to be there and we're going back to the moon after 53 years, <laughs> not explaining their absence. So the question then becomes, um, as soon as Biden gets into office, oh, that's off. No, it's not going to be 2025. We'll do it some other time later, maybe by the end of the decade. And we have to rearrange the plans around this. This is how this conversation was going. And when you look at that, you can instantly see that they were anticipating something else. And so this shortage now of material to build these types of ships is something that they had figured into their plans already when Biden got in. These are the telltale pieces. Now, uh, let's start to think about the UFO file secret space program aspect of this. Before we get into that, Ms. Olivia, what do you got? Uh, I was just thinking, you know, what we're experiencing here is global capture. You know, yes. there's, we have regulatory capture, we have media capture, we have political capture. Um, this is a prison planet. That was, <laughs> well, that's the Alex Jones. I know, but it, it's true, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, um, if you're captured, you are in a trap. You're in a cage. Isn't that a prison? Absolutely. And you know what that makes me think of? Um, you know, for so long, 
with the Nazi program, they were thinking about going to space, but the whole goal of that was this controlling aspect of being able to terrorize the population on the ground from space. <laughs> they weren't interested in space exploration for the heck of it. I mean, maybe there was some archaeological interest because they had deep archaeological interests in Atlantis after all. But um, this idea that they could control things from space was the original goal of their rocket program. So when you think of all the steps that have led us here and how we went from a freedom-loving idea of space as a place that war would never invade and we never place armaments up there and Kennedy's vision of a peaceful development of space just being completely thrown out the window. And uh, now we have a space company right in the middle of a war directing uh, the satellites and all the rest of it. And they're going to get into some shooting aspects. And then we have the leader of that corporation, Musk, doing this bellicose routine with the leader of a sovereign country. Um, this is problematic all around because this is a corporation and they don't have the ability to take war actions against a sovereign nation at all. So it's very, very strange. But if you're trying to set up a space government, which will rule from above, then it starts to make a little more sense about where they're coming from. Let's find out the origins on some of this. And speaking of origins, we've got Blue Origin. <laughs> what was it that Jeff Bezos from Amazon did just before all this stuff kicked in? Well, he stepped down as the CEO of Amazon, and he became just the full-time guy for Blue Origins, which is his version of the space aspect. Uh, SpaceX has their, of course, exteganography, meaning, yes, we're moving the advanced technology into space. And um, our friend, though, Bezos, uh, also being, he's not the richest man in the world, but he's right, <laughs> he's in the top three. His exteganography with Blue Origin, which we've sussed out on this program before, he's also there to exploit that X factor and say, we have it and this is how we use it. Uh, there's a series of things relating to him and exteganography. I have so many in relation to Musk and Bezos using the exteganography that for me, it's very obvious what they're indicating that they're using the advanced X technology. Now, remember that technology resides inside the UFO file. Doesn't mean it's all alien origin. It just means it's that advanced. And uh, that's something for us to keep in mind. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. This is X Series 122, Part 2. And we're going deep here on the wars and rumors of wars and rumors of space wars. And how does Musk fit into all that? We're going to be taking your questions uh, in about a half hour in the second part of the program. And we're, we're really enjoying this uh, Part 2 of our four-year run here on the X series. And, uh, you know, it's been tremendous with the feedback and the cooperation uh, and the support from you guys. We really appreciate that. What I want to do next, oh, what do you got there, Miss Olivia? Uh, Brenda Fisher says SpaceX's involvement is an example of WEF's glorious public-private partnership, is it not? <laughs> That's true. Um, this is interesting, too, because if you stole uh, the citizens' money to build a massive space infrastructure, and then you invited it, you didn't, you kind of minimized the public space programs and you maximized the privatization of space. Basically, you've had the public pay for the massive space infrastructure and uh, they don't get any benefit from it. These companies do. And then one way or another, they get the upper hand on the citizens. And I think um, the idea, again, with Musk, there's, there's not only occult pieces that are there, and there's not only uh, steganography and things of this nature, mm -hmm. but there's a deep story there uh, also about how von Braun, who came out of the, who was the leader of the German rocket program and came over here through Paperclip, and we've done a series of those shows with uh, Dr. Joseph Farrell, who really understands what the Nazis were up to on this. I you know, a lot of researchers don't. <laughs> they see them as a caricature of just white supremacy or something like that. 
And you have to understand that the Nazis very, very detailed plans for world domination that go far beyond um, just that one, uh, you know, kind of caricature. But what's interesting to me is when we look at that is that he wrote a novel von Braun. Uh, well, there's a few things I found out about him. Interesting sources too. Russell Targ, who ran the remote viewing program, actually uh, told me that von Braun asked him to develop an ESP tester machine because he wanted the astronauts to be able to test their ESP because he learned that a lot of the best astronauts had high ESP ratings. And, uh, of course, he did develop this. And there's actually a version of it that you can download on your app at ESPResearch.com. And um, <laughs> it's a very interesting little app. But Targ said that um, he learned through von Braun that von Braun's mother was very psychic and that people all around would come to her and she would know about things of the future. Well, we also see that von Braun seemed to dabble in some of this himself. So when he wrote the sci-fi novel about uh, Foundation of Mars and a, the character who's leading that uh, foundation of a new civilization on Mars is Elon. And uh, I remember when I found out about this, I, I checked it out thoroughly and I went to Dr. Farrell with it. And he couldn't believe it either. Mm -hmm. He said, can this be true? I was like, you know, I got a couple of different sources and I checked it out thoroughly and like, look at this. And he got so deep on this, um, but none of us could really believe it. And I still am shocked that this is out there. And it reminds me very much of those time travel Trump books, which are just barren Trump. You know, it's, it's hard to believe. Um, but what I want to say in relation to that is um, there are a lot of tracks like this around Musk, including the fact that he, the company that he had was X.com. He was signaling somewhere in that Silicon Valley setup. He got access to the X technology. And the people, remember, who control the X technology is not just a government technology. It is an aerospace, private, public aspect. So I, that kind of gets around the question you asked, I believe. Um, and so it doesn't reside necessarily in any one political situation or any particular corporation, although Lockheed Martin is, is <laughs> a leading, uh, I would say you could find a lot of it right there, but it seems to, there's some blending of those that gives us that central piece in relation to where the X technology resides. And they decided to use Musk to get this out there and to use him as the figurehead for it. And I think at times when he shot his mouth off, we've seen that stock go down. You know, he said something and the stock went down $4 billion. <laughs> That's how tenuous that position is when you get it. And uh, in terms of control, we have the situation of Howard Hughes and Hughes Aerospace to help us to understand how that kind of deep political power gets out of control using a corporation of that size. So um, everything is being set up for the richest man in the world, you know, because those electric cars are going to be the most important thing and the space program and uh, space mining and space tourism and all that stuff. So it's all being wrapped around this one individual. And we need to get to what they're using here with the Starlink Ukraine piece to figure out what's going on. Because the next piece, of course, that they're coming up with is the UFO threat. And that's what we need to get to. All right, I'm gonna jump into that part. Miss Olivia, do you have anything else? Uh, CaritasTarot.com wants to know, DJ, would you ever entertain the idea that Elon Musk is an owned clone? <laughs> if there are pictures of him from the 90s and he looks very different. He's balding. Well, he, he, yeah, he had a hair transplant. He definitely had a hair transplant, big deal, but you know, what I mean is that he just seems very different as if, uh, I don't know, it seems like his whole personality is, is transformed. And there are a lot of interesting pieces in his background that give us hints about what might have been taking place there. But um, I also see that, you know, when you're being prepped, when you're being primed for this role, I think that they were looking at a few people for this role. They were looking at Bezos and figuring out that he didn't have the personality to pull it off and that there's something kind of, <laughs> you know, geek like, and he, he's not particularly good. He doesn't have the kind of charisma that's required. Um, and I think there were other 
uh, you know, I think Branson is somebody they regard as too unstable to leave this, although he's still in the picture. And of course, Bigelow, uh, Bigelow is a big mystery because he's, he's so wrapped in that UFO piece that I think they were worried, oh, they're going to know all the UFO side if, if him and his space hotels become the thing. But Bigelow Aerospace, um, SpaceX, Blue Origins, and um, Virgin Atlantic, those, all of those efforts, I think, were being measured out by this force that is taking those rules of continuity of government and the secrecy and applying it and have been creating that secret space program infrastructure. I want to mention how this works for a minute because it might seem to somebody who had just stumbled upon this, well, how could they do all this without government oversight and everything else? Well, if you look at the continuity of government plans, they were set up under Eisenhower initially to avoid a nuclear incident uh, and decapitation of the leadership. So if there was a nuclear exchange and the Soviets bombed the United States, they would have a secondary government built up underground they could still call the shots, respond, and bring the culture back after 100 years. Um, that secondary piece, what they call the Doomsday Network, grew and grew. But the secrecy size of it grew so much that the continuity of government piece got very involved and uh, with deep events relating to policy changes in the United States and elsewhere. Um, because of the deep secrecy around it, at a certain point in the 1980s, for example, you couldn't even bring it up in a congressional hearing. That's how secret it was. And in the 1980s, uh, it was Donald Rumsfeld, who he was the CEO of a corporation at the time, not even in government, a former Secretary of Defense at the time, and Dick Cheney, who was a congressman and from Wyoming, not in a dominant position, and... Um, he, he was working for an oil company. So um, these guys came in and created a whole new version of COG, which didn't require a nuclear exchange. It just required an emergency. <laughs> an emergency is the key word over and over again when we get into these things. But that continuity of government program set up an entire underground infrastructure, an entire underground power base. And once they got the... Uh, piece of it that they needed just to have any emergency and not necessarily a nuclear one, then they could really make extensive plans with it. And what happened is this doomsday network, communications network, got utilized in all kinds of deep events like Iran-Contra. It was utilized during the Kennedy assassination by uh, a Secret Service agent who was came out of that COG um, world. And then other people around Watergate, um, for example, John Dean, uh, they had worked and reset the rules around emergency planning over and over again. The COG crew shows up whenever something major happens. By the time you get to 9-11, Rumsfeld is there and Cheney is there. And what do they do? They actually execute continuity of government during the September 11th attacks. One of the things I point out on this show, which is something that I learned uh, through my interviews and talking with Professor Peter Dale Scott, is that we still live under the September 11th Emergency Act. So they never lifted that one. <laughs> and that means so many things like warrantless wiretapping and all the Patriot Act violations are all active. And every president, whether it's Obama or Trump or Bush or Stepford Biden, they all sign it because it's attached to the National Defense Authorization Act. And that National Defense Authorization Act has, as part of it, $800 million in military funding for a country that is not even at war. Um, so that massive piece, the Democrats and the Republicans all get together and sign off on that NDAA. <laughs> so that idea of, you know, uh, gridlock and all that stuff goes right out the window as soon as the close to a trillion dollars is at stake. But uh, now what's included with the COG September 11th emergency that's attached to the NDAA is what was held up this year, the ASRO. And uh, that's the anomalies survey surveillance. And um, this is the whole new UFO office that's been slipped in with Gillibrand and Rubio. They attach that in there and they said, you can't, you know, 
without this, you can't pass this legislation. So that $800 billion was going to get held up. So you can see how important then they're putting in that national defense infrastructure, the UFO threat idea and getting that office in there. And uh, it's the national intelligence, a director of national intelligence, Avril Haynes, that these people have to report to now. So we have the intelligence game controlling this infrastructure that is preparing for a UFO threat. That's where they're taking this. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. We had a lot in here and a lot to get to. Um, <laughs> we got. I know. I just there's <laughs> a lot right. of swearing tonight. I've got oh, to manage really? it. Don't you know that this is a family show? There's no swearing. Um, I will Unfortunately, say, I will say, I, you, and you know, I swear <laughs> like a sailor, but swearing does bring the vibe down. Uh, yes. Not, there's no question. No, I, I, I absolutely agree 100%. Um, <laughs> it's easy enough to express ourselves without it. Okay. Let's review a little bit the presidential side again and then do a deeper piece on Musk. Here we go. The UFO question. President Reagan was concerned about UFOs and he brought it up to Gorbachev. Remember I mentioned this? This again was the conversation. The CIA, the State Department, they did not want them getting together to talk about the UFO file. Reagan insisted and it happened. And for years it had been rumored, but it wasn't until 2015 when Gorbachev went before the press club was giving all these different stories that he blurted this out and everybody was shocked. And what Reagan said was, um, you know, I'm getting intel that there's going to be a UFO invasion. What they were doing, they were showing Reagan classified uh, information relating to UFOs. And when he was looking at the size and the number, he thought, oh, they're gearing up for an invasion. And in fact, he went before the UN and gave that amazing speech where he said, you know, if there was some alien threat out there, I wonder if us and the Russians wouldn't get together and fight it off and we'd be one human family fighting aliens. Very unusual, very, very unusual. And the State Department and the intelligence people try to take that out of his speech, just like in Eisenhower's speech, the CIA and the State Department try to take the military industrial complex threat out of the speech, and they have to do all these things to get around it. With Kennedy, it's the American University speech when he says, what kind of a, a peace do we seek, not a Pax Americana by American weapons of war? You know, we all breathe the same air and we can't afford to fight a nuclear battle where even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. That whole piece, we have to understand, that was the language that these uh agencies, the Central Intelligence Agency, and then that whole apparatus, the DIA and um, military intelligence, didn't want him to say that. Uh, so in this case, Reagan is getting shown kind of selected stuff, and he's starting to think, oh, there's going to be an invasion. So he takes Gorbachev aside, and Gorbachev remembers, he's like, he's dead serious. Now, here's the interesting thing that didn't get revealed from Gorbachev, which is that his predecessor, Andropov, who was KGB head like Putin is, was, had started this whole open UFO reporting thing, had trained his soldiers to watch for UFOs, to make reports about them, had centralized the database around UFO research. He was very advanced on it. And he set up a whole 13-year program around it, as you recall, I read in the beginning. So... Gorbachev also knew about <laughs> the alien part. And of course, he reassured Reagan, of course, I'll back you up if the aliens invade. But they both, both parties sitting together understand the aliens and the UFO piece. Um, and what's interesting is, and what I speculate also, is that the deep state is manipulating Reagan by taking some of their redeveloped UFO uh, X technology vehicles and make them appear menacing. You know, so, oh, they're, they're threatening our bases or they're flying over our nuclear facilities, et cetera. Um, those types of actions could be the provoked, you know, the, the kind of provocative actions that you would see that a false flag style operation was, was being introduced. This is the problem because, you know, 
let's talk about a couple of different incidents. You know, take the Phoenix Lights incident, for example. Um, it's got the earmarks more of a Lockheed Martin style appearance of their version of a UFO and using the missing trillions to create that. And it even has that signature of, you know, what a population would do. They're getting all kinds of information. What happens if a UFO sits for many hours over a major city right outside of Phoenix? And we have all these strange reports as a result of it. Sure, it could have been an alien um, ship, but it could have been Lockheed Martin. And so this is the problem that we face and what our central focus around the X technology can help us because if we understand where they're at in their redevelopment program of uh, the X technology, we can understand what they can pull off and what they can't. And this is the problem because in society right now, we have a schizophrenic situation where they're still talking about, oh, you know, fighting over oil resources or nuclear superiority. You know, I've made a point that Reagan and Gorbachev offered the zero option, which was to eliminate any nuclear armaments on the planet, meaning they had something else because they weren't going to leave themselves vulnerable <laughs> in that sense. Um, so they were going to eliminate them as a potential toxin for the planet, but meaning we have something else. We already know we have something else. And this gets us into the whole Star Wars conversation. So um, what they do with Reagan is they scare him and they say these UFOs are flying around. And what he does is he develops the Star Wars program, the Strategic Defense Initiative, supposedly a space-based anti-missile system that's going to shoot down Russian missiles when they come in. Um, but what's interesting about this and, and the piece that I think um, is crucial to understand is that it's actually being built and he's saying, I'll share the technology with the Soviets. And the Russians are coming to him and saying, if you build that, we can't have any arms control talks. Everything's off the table. So when that zero option comes up and they say, we're going to eliminate all nuclear weapons, Gorbachev goes to Reagan and he says, will you give up SDI? That's part of this. And Reagan says, oh, I can't. And everyone assumes it's because, oh, he needs this anti-missile program as a shield for the United States against nuclear weapons. But they've scared Reagan so much in the background with the alien talk that he can't give up SDI because he thinks he'll be creating this vulnerability for the entire planet. So that's why the zero option never kicks in. But it's a very interesting chapter that takes place in history, supposedly during a failed summit in Reykjavik, where they reach actually no accords, which was pretty unusual in any way. Um, but that's where we see the UFO file on the public stage with no name. We can't see why they're doing the things that they're doing unless we understand the UFO file is involved. And that UFO file activity around the X technology is getting massively manipulated by the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department. That's where we see uh, you know, them trying to prevent, for example, Kennedy meeting Khrushchev alone. Uh, Reagan meeting with Gorbachev alone, and so on, uh, and Trump with Putin. And they really set up a thing with Trump with Putin because they already had this plan to isolate Putin long before he took the bait and rolled into Ukraine. Um, so you can see we're at a crucial stage here. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. We're going deep, deep now into the UFO file. This is the piece that's going to really open things up. We're going to be taking your questions shortly. I want to remind you to go to... Um, darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, that's a free newsletter and it's going to keep us in touch with each other um, beyond any social media censorship. And we've certainly seen a lot of it, but somehow through some miracle, we're still here talking and you're there in the ideas room. So that's good enough for me. Um, before I go any further, what you got out there? Uh, Wally Tango Foxtrot wants to know, uh, the UFOs over Washington in 52, were they a con continuation of an alien invasion psyop? Test the herd's acceptance? Yeah, that's an interesting one because you have a massive sighting over Washington, D.C., and you definitely are freaking out the national security state, the president, and the potential for real panic there in the public. Um there's no way to say what it is. 
really, but um, it's definitely a show of strength by somebody. And we just don't know if that's the off-world visitors or if it's her own group on the inside. What's your gut tell you? Um, I think it's possible that the uh, there was a genuine UFO file, uh, you know, off-world visitors involved in that. I think, you know, there are only certain sightings that give me a feeling. Mm. And it's a very specific feeling. Yes. It's somewhat uneasy. Uh, because it does feel like it's from another world. And those images do that, give me that feeling. There's a, um, there's a sighting out of Australia. Uh, the woman's name is Kelly. I'm trying to think of her last name. But um, she is part of an abduction scenario that takes place on a highway. And it was Oz Encounters. Yes. That, it yes. was like a TV uh, show. Oz Encounters had all these incredible um, Australian UFO encounters. And... But that story had been around for years because it actually happened in 1992. And um, I think the, the name uh, of it will come to me while we're uh, on here. But um, the types of grays that showed up there, they had the big eyes and everything else, but they were red. And the way that they sent out these lights and the woman felt it in her abdomen and it felt like somebody sort of punching her in the stomach. And so she was kind of crippled and they came at her very fast, you know, so they're very different type of setup. When you mentioned that idea of a feeling mm -hmm. connected to it, um, you know, when I've, I've talked to a lot of abductees and when I've, I've listened to them, I've connected in at times that way with some of their experiences and you can. Uh, Kelly Cahill. Kelly Cahill, exactly. That's the case. I highly recommend uh the background on that one because so many interesting things happened around it because other people were there on the highway and their memories came back eventually too i don't think that that case uh there's any kind of psyop associated with that i think this is genuinely some off-world visitors just like voronezh <laughs> voronezh feels weird to me that way too and um uh, I mentioned that there's this group called the Transcenders who had predicted this October 13th, 2010 sighting over New York City. Much to my surprise, it came true. And I got in touch with them eventually and spent many hours um, talking with them. And uh, Rick Thurston was this kind of Casey type channel. But one of the things that he told me was that Foreignage was, in fact, two alien groups materializing at the same time <laughs> in that park in Russia. And, um, you know, from that sort of psychic perspective, he was, he was dialing into that. And what's strange about it is um, I've seen those interviews 20 years later with the kids who were there and there were a lot of kids in the park and there were some adults. <laughs> one of the weirdest stories is that one of the aliens was taken by the police and put in like, you know, <laughs> a wagon and it just disappears, you know? So um, it's a very unusual case. The fact that it came up in relation to the Ukraine war, I still don't think we have the whole enchilada on that. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show, episode 122, part two. Here we go into the UFO file piece a little bit deeper, and then we're gonna figure out how Musk fits in. All right. so. Uh, we gave you the piece about Trump and the Space Force. That was about moving the UFO file back under executive presidential control. But what happened when Gary McKinnon, uh, who was the known as the NASA hacker, got into NASA files, he saw that there was an off-world officers list there. And a lot of people try to dismiss that story, but in fact, the secret space program came from the idea that there was an officer's list that he had seen along with all of these pictures of UFOs and things when he hacked into NASA. Um, the United States wanted him badly. <laughs> they wanted him about as bad as they want Julian Assange. And um, in fact, whenever anyone tries to debunk that McKinnon thing and say, oh no, that wasn't about the secret space program or whatever, let me tell you something. On the record, Obama went over to England to talk to them about getting Gary McKinnon because they wanted to know how much he knew from scanning those records about the UFO file. That's why they wanted him here. 
And there's a trail as long as a mile about that story. There's no way for anyone to spin it any other way. They wanted McKinnon and they wanted him because he had tapped into those UFO files and seen the off-world officers list. And that's a big, big problem on the national security end. Um, and Obama, at that level, you know, you can imagine maybe sending over defense secretary or chief of staff or something. Obama wants, he's talking about it himself with James Cameron, right, who was the prime minister at the time. How important was the Gary McKinnon case that Obama is dealing with it on a presidential level? Obviously, he had seen that key piece of the secret space program and uh, evidence relating to UFOs. And there's a lot out there about McKinnon. I don't even need to go into his story that deeply, but it's very important, I would say, that we understand the level and the importance that they place on this. All right, so what happened after certain things came out? Of course, we did a secret space conference with Joseph Farrell and uh, Linda Moulton Howe and Catherine Austin Fitz, and it really took the whole thing to a different level. John Brandenburg was there. Um, and this took place in 2015, and the whole thing around the secret space program became understandable from a financial, political, and um, technological point of view. Instantly, tons of disinformation around the secret space program started to pour out, and the UFO threat thing became uh, the number one piece. And those agencies loved to promote all the garbage around secret space, you know, blue aliens and all this kind of stuff. And there were a lot of jokers out there who were willing to do those types of stories. But what's interesting is the UFO threat piece comes up right after that. And it's in relation to Podesta and Hillary and the idea that Hillary's going to go into the White House and they can pull off this whole thing with Elizondo pretending to be this whistleblower from a UFO agency and all that. Look at the people who were behind it. Ex-CIA boss John Brennan believes there may be life beyond Earth. Well, who's Brennan? Brennan's the drone king, right? He got famous in the uh, as a CIA boss during Obama's administration for droning citizens. Um, and what he would do is to get one terrorist, he would drone a wedding party or something, kill 50 people and maybe even miss the target. And for him, it was, this is the rules of engagement. You know, this is, uh, this is just the price of doing business. So now these guys who are basically, you know, have this incredible low mentality when it comes to, uh, you know, the activities that they do. And these guys are now coming out and being the like, you know, I love you and <laughs> I'm going to give you UFO disclosure. And you have all these people lapping it up, which is quite absurd. In relation to uh, the story of the Hunter Biden laptop, as I mentioned, 50 of these intelligence officials, all top dogs, you know, heads of the DNI, the CIA, and all the rest, all said it was Russian disinformation. Well, now it's admitted a year and a half later after the election, now that it doesn't matter, that all the weird stuff going on there with Biden, uh, Hunter Biden selling access to his dad, Stepford Biden, uh, and all the weirdness around, you know, the child porn on his uh, computer and the, the just the freak show of, of exploits on that laptop that really would have changed the outcome of the election no matter what, um, they decided that they would lie about it. But now that it's been exposed and even the New York Times admits it, these guys still won't. And uh, Twitter, of course, as I've mentioned, and I think it was a red line in the sand, they banned the story from the New York Post from their account and they banned the New York Post until they took the story off their Twitter account, which is incredible censorship that should have you know, of course, they did get Dorsey before Ted Cruz and some other people, and they roughed them up <laughs> verbally, big deal. That should have changed the entire structure. We shouldn't be dealing with these questions about Zuckerberg doing censorship and, you know, them allowing, you know, they have this ridiculous rule now where they say, hey, you can actually call for violence against Russian citizens. It's sick. It's very, it's sick, you know. Um, but you can't talk about <laughs> alternative therapies for something. So here's the story. Spies who lie. 51 intelligence experts refuse to apologize for discrediting the true Hunter Biden story. So how do you feel about that there when you look back on it? Even if, you know, somebody who's like incredibly inclined towards, uh, 
you know, getting Trump out of office and all the rest and wanted to get Biden in. Do you feel like 51 CIA people should be able to spin your version of reality, even if it's temporarily to your advantage? This is the problem that we face, and we need to look at it. The Central Intelligence Agency has committed crimes against the executive branch over and over again. And the first deep state revolt was 1963. So why should they stop if we're not holding them to account? This is how we get into this. This story about the Hunter Biden laptop is a crucial because not only does it get into all the business corruption and personal corruption around the Biden family, but it gets into the fact that these 51 intelligence officials can create a different reality, a different outcome based on the fact of their influence. That's not a democratic country. We have to admit that. You're not going to get any kind of you know, democracy around the UFO file. <laughs> they're not going to give you any kind of truth around it if they're spinning something and it's proven to be a lie. And then they still won't say, well, yes, it was a lie and we, we have to own up to it. Um, so that's a problem. It's, it's actually a constitutional crisis about an agency that's grown out of proportion. And it's a whole deep state apparatus because I can isolate it to the Central Intelligence Agency to a point, but that sprawling apparatus that the Central Intelligence Agency is a part of for that deep state gives us tremendous problems. So when people come in from that Central Intelligence apparatus into the UFO field and say, oh, I'm a whistleblower, or oh, I am an abductee and all that stuff, no, you know, you don't deal with it. The one thing we can do on the independent side is boot those people out of the field. So that's the first thing that you do. No Elizondos, no Ramirez, none of that junk. And the people need to have, uh, who are in the field of research, need to have some backbone and do that. And not, you know, pal around with these people and try to get in their documentaries or some TV junk. This is the nature of the problem. This is, I mean, when I see the UFO field and I see different types of alternative research field, this is what I get to with dark journalism. Is it serious? Are you serious or not? Is it just entertainment? Do you just want to be on a show? Or do you really want to get to a certain type of outcome? I've in indicated individuals like George Knapp and Richard Dolan, people like that. Not because I have any personal problems with them. I actually like them both. <laughs> but, you know, these types of people let their audience down by not addressing it and not addressing the CIA influence into the fields that they operate in, namely the UFO field. So if the CIA is going to operate with a clean bill of health from the people who are supposed to be the watchdogs around it, you probably need a new field. And I would recommend that if you're in the truth telling business, when you do journalism and you don't tell the truth, get out of the business, uh, get into something where, you know, not telling the truth is beneficial. <laughs> and there's lots of jobs like that. For example, mm -hmm. Wall Street will take you in, in a heartbeat. But I think it's crucial because, um, you know, and it also goes for the social media companies in Silicon Valley. Do they just want to create a fake reality where even when they're proven wrong, they're not going to go back on it? That's, Actually, that's a, you that's just stumbled sick, in yeah. to the, the crux <laughs> of <laughs> is. everything is, when are we going to stop creating fake realities. This is yes. the human condition. This is the problem here. Yes. Is that we we really cannot handle the truth. We crave the stories. We crave layers and layers of illusion, right? Um, well, a lot of people who are trying to prove a side of a particular thing, you know, so um, Obviously, a lot of these things have been mapped out in advance. The COVID op, for example, all the virtue signaling, the masks and all this stuff. This was all mapped out in advance, even the disputes that people would have one to another. And it didn't really start to break down until they came to the children part. When they got to the children part, then things like Governor Youngkin, you know, in Virginia got elected over everyone's, uh, to everyone's surprise over Terry McAuliffe because he had said parents don't need to be involved in what their kids learn. And Youngkin had said, no, no, they do. And, and so McAuliffe coming up in this position, the state's right, and they'll tell you parents what to do. And Youngkin saying, no, the parents know what to do with their kids. And so there is that fundamental uh, core piece in people that they understand where that's happening. So as soon as we got to that point, and a lot of the COVID ops started to fall apart, boom, 
this is the Ukraine war. It just whips everything up. So you get into a fervor and you forget, oh, yeah, these people have been lying to us. <laughs> um, you know, so this is the nature, I think, of the kind of important place that we're at. And we can establish a totally new path here. Uh, and it's by taking the real facts on the ground and moving forward with it. The great place to do that is the UFO file, in fact. And especially since the mainstream forces are exploiting it against uh, the civil population. And whether it's a threat idea or the idea of a, a, an AI coming in that we need to, you know, like the Galileo project, <laughs> I'm fond of pointing out that Avi Loeb's uh, astrophysics lab is, is about five minutes behind us here. And their whole thing about the Galileo project is, oh, you know, this Amuamua that came in, they are AI and we need to get up to snuff. And what's going to happen with that op, which is different from the threat op, is the AI is going to communicate to us, oh, you're destroying your planet <laughs> and everyone needs to pay a carbon tax to fix it. But don't charge the corporations, just charge the public. And that's where they're going. So they have different operations running. But it was interesting if you watch the background around the Galileo project, because at first they started off with scientists and different people involved. And then all of a sudden, the same CIA faces started showing up. They're all involved. And then finally, Elizondo and uh, Chris, Christopher Mellon, the former uh, defense uh, an analyst in the Bush administration during Iraq war. I mean, this, this is the ilk of the people they were bringing in. So we have to kind of, um, we have to see these things for what they are and not, you know, let's don't believe the hype. I'm going to start playing the song. <laughs> Uh, everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show, and we are going deep here in episode X-122. It is, in fact, the secret space government. We're going to be taking your questions here. Um, what I'm going to do, actually, I have a couple of things to get to, and then we'll dive right into questions, and I'll jam whatever else I have into the episode as well. I want to remind you uh, all that it's great to have you here for uh, part two of our four-year celebration of the X-Series. And we thank you for all your support. Um, and I want to remind you, if you haven't yet, to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter that keeps us in touch uh, throughout any kind of uh, social media battering or shadow banning or <laughs> deplatforming that can happen. I want to mention something um, this to reveal this step because it's crucial. Again, and I've talked about this. WikiLeaks reveals Tom DeLonge's UFO emails with Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman. This is important. When they thought Hillary was going to get in, the whole Elizondo, DeLonge, all that stuff was set up. And um, the To the Stars Academy was set up as that CIA corporation that was going to be the liaison between the administration and the public about the UFO threat. But um, Podesta, of course, very dicey character, shows up in um, a number of unusual <laughs> investigations and has quite a background, shall we say, but a deep interest in the UFO uh, phenomena and Crowley and other things of this nature. Hillary, of course, was using the UAP uh, moniker, and she was you know, on this early trying to push that during the election, like I'm going to open up UFO files. And this was unusual uh, in that period. And DeLong, this whole glommed in piece of Podesta and DeLong, the emails between DeLong and Podesta, I think show also that they were gearing up for this. They did not expect Trump to get in there and derail their piece. So when they run that op in 2017 and they don't have the presidential power, it shows up, it runs kind of short, and TTSA wobbles all over the place. You know, at one point they have Harry Reid, the late Harry Reid, as their spokesperson, and uh, Harry Reid was not known <laughs> as an honest individual um, Senate Majority Leader, and uh, Tom DeLong for a while is the spokesman, and then at a certain point it looks like, you know, celebrity rehab <laughs> is going on, and um, to say the least, and then finally they settle on Elizondo and Mellon. And um, this is kind of the weird spinoff about it. And I'm emphasizing this because Elizondo now has a documentary coming out on HBO, like an auto 
biographical thing. And he has a book coming out. But it's very important that um, the analysis on the UFO file from uh, somebody like him, what they're going to do, this is how they're going to feed the CIA line through the public. So this guy's going to be set up as he has been, you know, he's the GQ hero of the year and all this nonsense. So that's what happens when the CIA is behind uh, a whistleblower. Take the case of Phil Schneider, for example. This is somebody who came out and talked about our relationship, the deep state relationship with the alien factor and how he was building underground bases as part of a government contracting piece in that he learned that there are aliens in some of those bases. So this guy, he didn't get a book deal or a documentary. What happened to him? He got strangled with piano wire. You know, um, so we have to understand what a whistleblower is and what a CIA operation is, as gruesome as that uh, is. And, um, you know, we can't fall short on the alternative media side in relation to this. And certainly when it comes to um, the type of journalism that we do here, I've been saying since Elizondo came out, you know, how many lies that this guy's been telling. So it's a crucial piece that somebody like that isn't allowed on the alternative side to spin that CIA spin and grease those CIA wheels. I think that's crucial. The mainstream is going to pick up on it because they're under the influence of the Central Intelligence Agency. And a lot of them just don't know any better because they don't know anything about the UFO file, frankly. But the alternative media knows. So, and they know that the CIA is up to no good. So there's no real excuse for pumping them up. So I think that's a, a key point. And I think uh, the WikiLeaks story on that really gives us the piece. Um, more on intel on the UFO side. In dramatic shift, National Intelligence Director does not rule out extraterrestrial origins for UFOs. That's Avril Haynes. Avril Haynes was John Brennan's deputy secretary at CIA, known as the drone queen, because she would find all kinds of legal reasons why they could do these incredible drone attacks that were so destructive. Um, let's keep going through this for a moment. Uh, I pointed out that Judge Napolitano, who anyone who's libertarian, you know, knows Napolitano because he's such a champion of libertarian values. But at one point, he was actually close to Trump. They had a falling out later. I think they're kind of back to being friends now. But um, one of the things that he was convinced Trump was going to do is release the JFK assassination files, which are still locked up um, by the Central Intelligence Agency. And um, Biden, of course, locked them up now for another four years. But um, Trump was giving every indication to Napolitano that he, in fact, was going to release these records. But what happened, interestingly enough, was when it came around time, the CIA made such a case that they should not be released that they convinced him to only release a partial amount. Some of those records were crucial, but it left out the most important details. Um, and so Napolitano said, look, you know, what's going on here? Because you said you were going to, I know that you wanted to release these things. And Trump said, Andrew, you wouldn't believe what's in there. And I can't. And if you were me, you couldn't either. Um, now, this thing about the Kennedy records has always been like, you know, you always expected, well, they, if there were actual evidence of the CIA assassinating JFK, you know, it wouldn't be in the records. It's just something around those records might open up more leads into what happened um, because the national security state eliminated its own leader. But what's interesting about this, I believe, is that somehow, probably through Robert Kennedy, there was a mechanism left in those records. And I believe it relates directly to the UFO file because nothing, in my opinion, could really be the game changer that Trump was talking about why the records couldn't be released in full, unless it related to something directly, uh, you know, that transformative. Because if it just said five CIA people were involved in a massive conspiracy and they set up all these things, people kind of know that. They kind of know that the Central Intelligence Agency was deep, deep involved in... Yeah, it wouldn't be that shocking. Exactly. So the cover-up aspect, 
you know, we've, it's gone on for 60 years. We understand it. The assassination, the fact that the CIA are assassins and they assassinated a leader 60 years ago and that President Kennedy, you know, it must be the reason that they assassinated him and that that is somehow spelled out in those records. That would be a reason for those records not to come out. But Napolitano was shocked because he was like, you know, just days before Trump was absolutely convinced he was letting them out. And he said, they showed me things in the records and we can't let them out. Think about that. Uh, I mean, it is, it, it kind of gets the mind going as we get deeper on this UFO piece. Yes. It would have to affect the economy for Trump to be frightened of the effect. Interesting. And yes. that's what he cares about. Yeah. To his credit. You know, um, I'm not criticizing him for that, but th that's his priority. Well, that's fascinating, too. I think um, what's so interesting about it is it opens up the idea because we've seen Trump talk, for example, he had an interview with his son where he talked about Roswell and said there's a lot of very interesting things there. And, you know, people there in Roswell would like to know. <laughs> um, so. He understood, and again, this goes into John Trump and the thing that we'd, we've done an episode here, which is actually in the four years, is the most popular episode of the X series. It is called Tesla Trump and the Time Capsule, which does have a lot of this laid out. And fundamentally, it's that Vannevar Bush was the mentor of John Trump, and Vannevar Bush was the head of the UFO file, uh, according to Robert Sarbarker, who was the physicist who let so much of this out and then was whitewashed in history. Um, but if that was his mentor and then Vannevar Bush was the one who sent John Trump, who was an uncle of Donald Trump, who he's very close to, that's something we've covered extensively on this program. But I think it leaves open this idea, this understanding that the UFO file is core when we look at the Trump presidency through his uncle, John Trump. And remember, he got sent in, um, by the FBI to look at the Tesla papers, looking for evidence of that death ray and something that could take down objects at a distance, flying objects at a distance. So that if you were in Hawaii, you could press a button and something would go down over the UK. That's what they felt was in the Tesla records. And we don't know exactly what he actually saw because of course, he's just gonna say, oh, I found nothing. <laughs> but uh, that John Trump piece with Vannevar Bush gives us the understanding now we take it up to 2018 with Trump making the space for us. And that makes a whole lot more sense. And then when we see these activities now about um, Elon Musk and them electing him as kind of the head of the space government, and he's giving aid to the Ukraine, as I said, this is just an independent CEO of a corporate, you know, corporation, space corporation. Yeah. But, um, you know, how does that give him any ability to act in a political fashion and lend aid to a particular country, for example? Answer, it doesn't. So something's going on there in relation to what's happening. So that COG piece, how they built this infrastructure in space is they just took the, the rules of continuity of government, which are so secret because they were originally set up for us to survive a nuclear war and just flipped them into space and said, well, the same rules apply in space, all the secrecy and all the rest. So you can build a massive space program without the oversight, same way you can build a massive underground continuity of government apparatus without any kind of oversight. And with that, Miss Olivia, I'm going to drop in more as we go, but let's start okay, with your questions. I don't know if you're covering this tonight, but Short Order Cook One wants to know, what's DJ's take on Elon Musk and his tunnel building obsession? Yeah, well, this is interesting as well. Um, we did a program about Musk and the company, uh, the boring company that he has, which is this incredible tunneling under Las Vegas and creating this massive um, infrastructure underground as well. So it's another one of these projects, just like, um, you know, his Neuralink and all the rest of it. But the, um, so much of that idea of artificial intelligence is going to run our lives and I can project my consciousness into a cube and all that. Um, you know, this guy knows <laughs> that that's not true. So for him to get behind, he was originally warning about artificial intelligence. Now he's a big champion of it. 
So Musk, again, is not, um, it's not like we're dealing with a single person again. He is, in fact, a combination of influences the way that Hughes was. And they're using the face of Musk to get different things accomplished. Um, but I think with Neuralink, for example, it's a kind of illness, um, the way that they're developing these things. They're saying oh, it's for the greater humanity and all the rest of it. But even the testing is, is very inhuman, uh, the way that they're doing it on animals, and gives us a hint of the kind of viciousness of the culture inside of those companies that Musk runs. Now, um, you know, I think that there's something that says that Musk has acted independently at times to his credit publicly, um, but that's a controlled person because everything that he wants to do there in space and all the rest of it needs the rubber stamp of the national security state. And we know those people aren't very trustworthy. So we're never going to get any answers from, you know, Musk, <laughs> just like you're not going to get answers from the CIA. It doesn't work that way. It has to work kind of from the ground up to demand accountability. It's not going to work from these lofty figures. What I want to point out about Musk is the caricature that they're setting up for him as the space, uh, the leader of the space government. This is really what's embedded in Werner von Braun's book about him leading Mars. It's in there. It's sort of like a mythology has been built and then he's just kind of showing up to take the brass ring on it. Um, so we're going to get into some strange things in relation to Musk. And this is one of them, which is, Elon ruling over Mars. Did Werner von Braun predict Elon Musk's plan to colonize the Red Planet in 1953? <clears throat> in the 1950s, German rocket scientist Werner von Braun eerily predicted Musk's plot to colonize Mars. Writing in his 1953 science fiction novel, Project Mars, engineer Braun described the man called Elon, E-L-O-N, who ruled over the Red Planet. It appears that there aren't enough headlines already about the CEO of Tesla Motors and SpaceX founder Elon Musk that there now resurfaces a connection between his name and a decades-old book. Um, and this came out heavily after he appeared on Saturday Night Live, interestingly enough. Many of us knew it in the alternative uh, community, but it wasn't the stuff of public uh, cachet. And then out of nowhere, the New York Post had it. You know, there's just everywhere. They were laying it out. So very fascinating, that piece. But it tells us that there's a mythology, a building block of mythology there that has uh, at its core our friend Elon Musk. Yes. Uh, Debbie Klingelsmith, is Elon Musk looking for ancient underground civilizations? No question. Well, here's another thing I found out that's interesting when we see him with Ghislaine Maxwell is he has his own ex-submarines. <laughs> And uh, you remember that story that came up about some people trapped uh, in a cave and um, he had a big Twitter fight with the guy who was going down there to rescue these people, supposedly. And um, he was offering his submarine services. So this is a guy, again, who's the corporation is involved in everything, right? They're involved in transportation. They're involved in underground tunneling. They're involved in going to Mars. I mean, it's an everything company, right? The whole thing is there. Just like Bezos, you know, he got Whole Foods. So he's a food company and he bought the Washington Post. He's a journalism company. So um, it is this consolidation of everything into one centralized engine. And it is that centralization that kills creativity and increases disparities in the population and makes the situation very schizophrenic. So if anything, what we need to do is fraction away from that kind of centralization and create all kinds of various different outposts. And the, the ideas room is a perfect example. I mean, it's a real outpost uh, relating to this. Yes. Cloudy with the chance of UFOs. Musk uses rockets uh, when we already have anti-gravity tech. Why? Yeah, um, Joseph Farrell talks about this, and I think it's interesting because he says the things that they want to do for mining asteroids and all this other stuff, you can't do with chemical rockets. So they know they're going to have to publicly display some of this stuff. This reminds me of a conversation I had with Catherine Austin Fitz, where she said, you know, part of the problem is the elites now have the technology age extension that can get them 
to live to 150 years old and they don't want everyone to get to 150 with them. So what do you do? So, uh, you know, <laughs> you create incredible control over what the public sees in terms of the media and what they believe and all the rest of it and what's acceptable. That's where they're moving toward. So they have these things at a certain level. They've broken off from traditional society. And a lot of that has to do with the UFO file, but it has to do with the X technology, which goes back. It, you know, it they're all kind of the same thing what's interesting, but I want to say that you can actually get to that point with the X technology through the work of like Nikola Tesla, for example, or through the technology that was kept by the mystery schools. You don't need this ET thing coming in, crashing and us redeveloping it. I'm sure that that happened, but you actually, even if you don't even believe in aliens, the X technology aspect is still entirely active because it's just about having access to that technology the same way we were going back in yesterday's episode into the ancient Atlanteans and what Casey and Steiner and Gerja and Blavatsky were saying about them. They were advanced technologically. They had access to this X technology. And um, so when you get into looking at it, is it aliens? Is it us and all the rest of it? I mean, at a certain point, Lockheed Martin has technology that's so far above our reasoning ability that it is kind of alien in any case. So we might as well be dealing with it as, a, as an alien uh, piece because they've made the culture schizophrenic by keeping people on one level while having something else that's operating up here a hundred years beyond them. So you're, you're not growing together anymore. <laughs> They're, you know, it's, it's a big club and we're not in it. That's the way it works. They're moving into their own little paradigm. And in their heads, you know, Think about the people who set up continuity of government. They're thinking, oh, civilization's been destroyed by a nuclear war and we're replacing it. You know, they're creating greenhouses and all these wonderful ideas for their families and the people that they think should survive, you know, and their idealization of, of a culture. And they're thinking of everyone else as just fodder for nuclear bombs, you know. So we have to kind of get into that psychology a little bit if we're going to understand them and where they're coming from. Everyone... <laughs> You're watching the Dark Journalist Show X Series 122, Part 2. And this is the Secret Space Government. We're taking your questions now. And I'm going to incorporate, I still have a lot more. <laughs> of... <laughs> i got to throw this at you. Yes. Okay, so Max Lupo says, Elizondo last Tuesday said UFO researchers get on board with their narrative or be left out. He also said <laughs> he will not do interviews with any dark journalists, which I found funny. <laughs> Well, here's the problem with Elizondo coming on this show, although he's welcome and uh, he would get a gentleman's debate out of it. Um, but he can't because there's only the only thing that you have to ask Elizondo is, are you still working for the Central Intelligence Agency? The real answer is yes. And I don't think he wants to lie publicly. The second question is, is part of your role in counterintelligence that you would, you know, since you lie, that's how you do counterintelligence. Would you lie to the American people if you were ordered to by your superiors in the Central Intelligence Agency? And then he'd have to answer, yeah, if I was in an operation, I'd have to lie about it. So therefore, all the stuff that he's saying could be a lie. <laughs> and so that's the end of the operation. So in those, I could ask those questions in the course of about two minutes, and that's the end of the Elizondo operation. That's the problem. So um, that's why a guy like that would never come on a show like this. It is interesting, though, because some people have spotted all the inconsistencies and they've even tried to kind of move around with him like, well, he was in a sensitive position or whatever. But there's a there's a whole backlog of three years of lying in the public. <laughs> and, you know, like the guys, the 51 intelligence officials who won't admit that the Hunter Biden laptop. Uh, was legit even after the New York Times, you know, liberal newspaper extraordinaire has admitted it. I mean, um, they're just, you know, they're addicted to the lie. And um, so Elizondo, I'm sure, is a, was a good counterintelligence agent, you know, but he's not someone to go to for the truth about the UFO file. Never. Yes. On that note, um, he has a book coming out. Yes. Yes. So, 
I'm going to ask you to prophesy <laughs> um, what is going to, it's pretty predictable. What is going to happen? Oh yeah. So he's going to be, out. he's going to be on Tucker Carlson. You know, he'll probably go on Joe Rogan. Um, he hasn't made it to Joe Rogan yet. Although Mellon did uh, Christopher Mellon. Of course we had uh, John Warner, <laughs> Christopher Mellon's cousin on here is the son of Senator, uh, the late Senator Warner and who, you know, blew the truth out there about his cousin and what they were up to with the UFO threat op. So that information is there. I mean, that the band for anyone who looks into it, the bandwidth, the comparisons there, but what's going to happen is there's going to be like this whole wave about Elizondo and, you know, the way Elizondo came out, it's very good to study it because what they did was they put him in the New York times originally, and they had to have pictures of him, and it said, like, disgruntled employee quits UFO program, exposes all to the public. And they had pictures of him. In this, these were not organic photos. This is like high-end photography. They had pictures of him, like, you know, in this shaded thing, and he had a grim look on his face. And, I mean, the whole thing was scripted in the beginning, and then it got sloppy, very, very sloppy, especially when they let DeLong out on Joe Rogan's show. But... They're going to do a lot of that. They've already had him on GQ. So all those major magazine outlets, they can deal with this kind of phony CIA version of the UFO thing. And he can continue to build the threat thing. Although I'll tell you, this is an interesting thing about what we've done here with the X series over the course of four years is we've pushed back the UFO threat thing. They don't use it as much because they realize that they stuck their foot in it. And so now they're talking a lot more about science and they're trying to kind of mirror subjects that we all study here, like psychic phenomena and things like that. They're trying to get a way that they can come in on a different angle because the threat part, uh, which is what they're really all about, and that like a, a Rubio or somebody like that is really ready to use, they can't really get the traction that they need because we expose them too early. <laughs> and um, But there's tremendous amounts of money behind that operation because what they need is they need to spin the UFO file their way. And um, if they do that correctly, they can get a whole apparatus financially. They can get a whole arms industry for dealing with aliens. And then they can create emergencies, uh, UFO emergencies, where they're, you know, they have to take power over the entire country because the aliens are invading, all that stuff. The UFO invasion op is the piece. That's the piece the ET invasion up. And they, they dangled that um, during the pandemic. And so it's, it's in their mind. They've, they've had the trial balloons. They've been, they've been testing it out. And I've been fond of saying, if you like the COVID op, just you wait, just you wait till they lay out the alien virus. <laughs> you know, that's one way they could be going. And I, I certainly think that they are, they testing out it is a chess game, right? You know, which way to go. But I'm very concerned with the focus on consciousness now. Oh, yeah. Um, so because we are in a time of warfare, conflict, and uh, citizens, um, things are getting ugly. Mm. And wouldn't it be great if there could be this new kind of new age movement, like a revival of the new age Ooh. movement. Oh, we're all supposed to be focused on our consciousness and, you know, raise, and we, we can't be caught up in conflict because now we're supposed to be spiritual. We're supposed to raise our vibration, which we should. <laughs> but if Lou, uh, and, and, you know, starts touting this, um, you know, wouldn't it be convenient so that we're not fighting uh it's, you know, guru, it's Guru Lu. He's going to come out. He's yeah, going to exactly. start. He's going to start wearing white. <laughs> he's gonna, they they did a little bit of this with him. He's like, what is what is consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This guy, the the different scripts that they put in front of this guy, like you have to make this one work. And uh, but there's a lot of training there, and it's not just him. I mean, Ramirez is another one that they're coming out with, and they're doing exactly what you're talking about, which is he's saying, oh, I was taken aboard and examined, you know. And he's using like a 1990s playbook for abductions. Uh, and so he's you know what it is? Be... You know what it is? I just really got it. So, you know, they had to squash the 90s new age uh, high vibe uh, movement, right? Because right. it, it, they weren't in control of it. It wasn't about them. Right. They weren't going to make a profit from it. They weren't going to have more control 
as a result of it, right? Yes. It was, we were going to elevate society. We were get we were getting somewhere. So here it fits in with their agenda. They know exactly where to place it. So what oh, yeah. the centralization, you've got to take the new agers, right? These people, they're all over YouTube, right? And, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. my peeps. But, you know, <laughs> how are you going to utilize that instinct, that desire for enlightenment? How are you going to weaponize it against those people? How are you going to use it to further your uh, goal of global control? That's really true. That's exactly what the point is. Um, well, I'd say there were successive attempts at disclosure, control disclosure. Certainly the 70s had it with close encounters of the third kind. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Reagan, when he invited Spielberg to the White House and they played E.T., he came out after the movie, Reagan, President Reagan, and said, we all know that this is actually not fiction. Uh, and he told all the guests there. Remember, Reagan also created Star Wars SDI because they had scared him into the idea that aliens were invading. But he knew about the UFO file. Uh, Reagan had his own track record. He even claimed that Air Force One in private was followed by a UFO at a certain point. Um, and there's a story from the 60s about him and Nancy showing up at a party. And of course, they had astrologers and close to Gene Dixon and all these other people. But they show up at a party and they say, we're sorry, we're late, but they were out of breath. And they were like, we were tracking a UFO. It was like right over the highway and we were driving right along with it. So, you know, Reagan's mentality was already geared into it before he got into the White House. And I think they actually used it against him um, with the piece. And I think that's where the whole Star Wars thing came up. But Star Wars SDI is still a piece of this. Uh, this is what we need to understand because the idea of a missile defense against an off-world invasion, um, it's still in the zeitgeist of the technology. And so we need to kind of keep that in mind as we go. I wanted to mention too, um, in relation to uh, Judy Wood, who has all these very interesting theories and the work that she did around 9-11, Where Did the Towers Go?, which incorporated all of this heavy-duty uh, directed energy weapons into the scenario and created a very compelling uh, picture with her scientific background. And I know some people who worked closely with her on it, and I know that she's not as active now, but I think that she got some very interesting points across. So this is just a little snippet. It's the Star Wars beam weapons. A Star Wars directed energy weapon, a focus on the Star Wars program by Dr. Judy Wood and Dr. Morgan Reynolds, posted now back in October of 2006. Um, at the time this article was being developed, many people expressed disbelief that energy weapons existed outside of science fiction until they were reminded of the Star Wars program known as SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative. The name of this article was chosen as a reminder that energy weapons do exist and have been developed over a hundred years. Most of this technology is classified information. It can also be assumed that such technology exists in multiple countries. The purpose of this article was to begin to identify the evidence of what happened on 9-11 that must be accounted for. In doing so, the evidence ruled out a kinetic energy device, like a bomb or a missile, as the method of destruction, as well as a gravity-driven collapse. Uh, SDI was created by U.S. President Ronald Reagan, March 23rd, 1983. So we're coming up to the anniversary. What is that? That's 40, 39 years ago mm -hmm. in a couple of days. It is thought that SDI may have been dubbed Star Wars by opponent Dr. Dr. Carol Rosen, a consultant and former spokeswoman for Werner von Braun. However, Missile Defense Agency historians attribute the term to a Washington Post article published March 24th, uh, March 24th, 1983, the day after the Star Wars speech, which quoted Democratic Senator Ted Kennedy, describing the proposal as a reckless Star Wars scheme before it was named the Star Wars program, SDI, in 1983. It was the Advanced Space Program's development. Um, so there's a piece there. There's this whole idea about directed energy weapons from space platforms and that 9-11 comes up in this mix and that those people like Wood who are familiar with that, 
understand that the antecedent, the setup, the foundation, uh, someone like Alana Freeland, for example, who we had on last week, would would uh, sort of understand this. SDI was the original piece of that energy weapons program from space. And now when we have Starlink, we have these things moving in from Musk and saying, I can defend Ukraine and all this other stuff. Um, again, they're, they're moving in, they're moving in the space grid. And that is the control grid from space. And we know so many of the things that are operational right now, our cars run on computers and all the rest of it. But here's the thing mixed that this system when it's fully implemented and the digital id system and the centralization of the finance etc this is getting into that territory that fitz talks about that these people if they don't want you to drive somewhere you won't be able to drive there and um you know this whole thing about shutting off the uh cars that are in russia <laughs> and all this stuff i mean it's too much central authority that's what's being handed over in the technology and that grid has to be run from where space and lower earth orbit that's you know that's how they run gps and everything else so we have to know the system that we're moving into so we can create structures uh for justice law and constitutional um living because if not these people are just going to run over a cliff and you're going to have space government czars uh like musk and you're going to have the klaus schwabs and the bill gates running you know your military, medical, and scientific living. I mean, it is literally uh, on that level. So we have a chance here. We have enough information to push back against it. And the more it gets exposed, the more that there's journalism and journalistic integrity around these things, the better chance that we have. Yes. Uh, Rod Megaton, does Russia have an Area 51? Oh, they certainly did. Um, what's interesting is Russia was known to be directly on par, if not superior, to the US program for the redevelopment of the UFO file. So they were right there, neck and neck with it. So the ability that they have, of course, you know, they were devastated during uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union and these things moved around, but uh, certainly Russia as it stands now has the best capability in relation to the UFO file. I would say it goes America, Russia, China, India, uh, and then South America comes into play. Um, but what's interesting about this for me is that we understand a lot in many ways about the American UFO file and the secrecy around it. The Russian part is still incredibly murky and it goes back again to those discussions that JFK was having with Khrushchev. You know, they're talking about sharing the UFO file. That's 1963. So 59 years ago, here we are again, and we still don't have answers around these things. It's, it's definitely unacceptable. Um, this picture I wanted to show actually is, here we have James Forrestal in the ruins. And you know, I was reading that quote from JFK, who accompanied him to post-war Berlin, observing the ruins. And there, back there, is John F. Kennedy in the sunglasses on tour with our friend Forrestal. And it's interesting because not only did he learn about the incredible devastation that was wrought as a result of the devastation of the, uh, the Allies against the Nazis and all the the things that the Nazis had brought down in terms of destruction. But um, Forrestal, knowing so much about the UFO file, clued Kennedy in on it. So, And they're both Catholic and they're both close. And uh, when Forrestal gets thrown out a window two years later, you know, we have to imagine the young congressman, Kennedy, becomes a lot wiser about the entire situation and the reasons behind it. Um, so that situation that plays out with Kennedy battling the CIA for control over the UFO file, which, you know, ends up in that conversation with Douglas Caddy, the Watergate lawyer who revealed to me that, 
his friend, E. Howard Hunt, who was the top CIA spy during the Kennedy period, said Kennedy was assassinated over the UFO file. So, you know, now it makes sense. Now it makes more sense than people have been trying to study this thing over the course of six decades. Think about it. The UFO file is the central core. And even right now, with this thing in Ukraine and Starlink and militarizing SpaceX and all the weirdness around our friend Musk, um, you know, we're looking at a pretty unusual scenario. But now it makes sense if you pursue it over the six decades. Reagan's SDI, uh, Kennedy's battle with the Central Intelligence Agency over the UFO file, and um, the subsequent battle of the Space Force versus the weird <laughs> Podesta DeLong. Uh, I mean, it's very interesting to see the surface players. If we can get closer to that inner core, we're in good shape. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Whew, going deep. Uh, we're going to take more of your questions. In fact, how are you doing over there? Good. You want a question? Sure. John Howard, I was going to finish with this, but I'm going to go for it now. <laughs> we are led by psychopaths who are playing a deceptive theater. Are they actually human? I mean, they don't have to be. <laughs> and at what point... It doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be both, you know? Something I always remember from the Casey work, when we talked about discarnate entities, and discarnate entities were entities, people that weren't alive, who were influencing people who were alive. And then he would go further and, you know, say that there were powerful individuals, sometimes kind of like black magic individuals who were hovering around. And the guy who was asking the question said, well, how am I supposed to understand discarnate entities? In case he said there's thousands about them, about us here at present. <laughs> so think about that. It's not just us in the world visibly, but there is the ghost of the world. And um, so these are the aspects that are influencing things that are going on here as well. Then we take your question and we don't have to just say, oh, sure, there's aliens that are doing it. And trust me, you know, a lot of this activity seems alien uh, by its very nature. Uh, you know, and I, I think about other groups, maybe different types of human beings. <laughs> Um, but this idea of discarnate entities also, you know, just the idea that we're in kind of a, a spiritual sea and we're surrounded by all these things. So there's a lot of information left, um, by the mystery schools and others that you know, is giving us that awakening on this. And so that, you know, let's face it for centuries, so much of the stuff was taboo. And if you talked about it, it could be burned at the stake, et cetera. So that's a trauma in the human psyche. So even being able to have that open conversation about spirits <laughs> and mediumship and discarded entities influencing the living for positive or negative purposes is a major conversation that can grow the culture dramatically. Uh, so I would say, yeah, they don't have to be. That's another, that's the cover of that book in 1952 Von Braun wrote the Project Mars book where he imagined the human colonists on Mars would be led by a person named Elon. Interesting little book, by the way. Um, Von Braun's a kind of a good writer in a weird way, strangely. Okay, I want to jump in with this section because I was going to get to this last night and I thought it's more appropriate tonight, but as the longer the night goes on, it's just not going to happen. Here it is, though. We're going to make it happen. Ghislaine hmm. Maxwell and our friend Elon Musk. Okay, steganography, Musk, steganography, Ghislaine. Steganography, Musk, the name of his children. Steganography, Ghislaine, her comments from prison. Are you ready? Let's start with Ghislaine, ladies first. Ghislaine Maxwell tells all from inside her US prison cell. Eris says, I am weak, frail, tired. I don't even have shoes that fit. Guards feed me rotten food, and one apple had maggots in it. Glenn Maxwell was speaking from her 10-foot by 12-foot prison cell inside New York's notorious Metropolitan Detention Center, where she spent the last 16 months in solitary confinement. Ms. Maxwell, 59, said, I have not had a nutritious meal in all that time. I haven't slept without the lights on. 
Fluorescent lights have damaged my eyes or been allowed to sleep without constant interruptions. This is from November 2021. She also claims that a friendly rat routinely sat next to her on an open sewer as she went to the toilet. Friendly rat. <laughs> That's interesting. I'm going to show you why. I should probably do this as it hits. Last Lunar Travelers, three humans and five mice. And there's a whole suggestion around Apollo 17 about a friendly, friendly mice. <laughs> but let's keep going. Uh, Maxwell has spoken for the first time about her living hell behind bars, claiming that she's been purposely assaulted and abused by prison guards, purposely deprived of sleep, given rotten food to eat, in a world exclusive Maxwell who had her $21 million bail application denied for the fourth time last week, also claims negative media coverage while she's been in custody, and the deliberate withholding of evidence have made it impossible for her to receive a fair trial. Speaking from her 10-foot by 12-foot cell inside New York's notorious Metropolitan Detention Center, where she has spent the last 16 months in solitary confinement, Ms. Maxwell said, I've been assaulted and abused for almost a year and a half. I've not had a nutritious meal in all that time. I haven't slept without the lights on. Fluorescent lights that have damaged my eyes have been allowed to sleep without constant interruptions. I'm weak, frail. I have no stamina. I'm tired. I don't even have shoes which fit properly. And she goes on and on about the food. Um, what's interesting is during the course of this conversation, let me see if I can find it. Um, she makes an allusion to the fact that the food that they're giving her is nuked like Chernobyl. Now, Chernobyl uh, won't come up in relation to this war until the end of February and into early March. So what is it that we have going on here where she mentions Chernobyl and for the first time, now Chernobyl happened in 1986. <laughs> Here is Ghislaine in her prison cell mentioning Chernobyl. Uh, that's pretty deep steganography for her. And I'm going to get into just how deep it goes and read a little more on this. But before I do, I'm going to flash to our friend Elon. And uh, some of this is, is so over the top, but I'm going to get into it. Elon Musk's baby name isn't just weird. It may be against California regulations. Elon Musk and singer Grimes announced their newborn son would be named XAEA12 Musk, A-12 Musk. But California regulations may put a stop to the name. Um, a couple of things to break down in there. So AE is the name of the theosophical artist who drew, um, he, he was kind of a famous artist inside theosophical circles and he drew the incarnations of Madame Blavatsky. Instantly, uh, I thought that was significant. X, of course, is self-explanatory. The X technology, very, very deep in Musk's case. A12, um, apparently now, let me get, this also a12 um according to musk himself relates to a version of lockheed martin's a12 which was stationed at area 51 and it was right when area 51 first opened that's the a12 that's his official explanation for it um so he's tying it himself in with area 51 but i think that the name a12 hangs out there. It's odd. It's the odd part. It's the other odd part of the name. Quick thing on A12. There's another shot of it a little bit closer. Um, A12, A-12, was something that was developed at Skunk Works, which is known as the hub of alien reproduction vehicles. And the first five A12s in 1962 were initially flown with Pratt Whitney engines they changed them. There's a whole history around them. But in June 1964, the last A-12 was delivered to Groom Lake, of course. And that eventually becomes Area 51. Um, 
So there's something kind of interesting about there. Earlier, somebody mentioned that the UFOs over Ukraine, and there was a UFO sighting over Ukraine, according to reports. And there's a lot of these uh, reports about this strange sighting of UFOs over there. And um, there's a number of reported documented UFO sightings, including one in which a UFO appeared to engage in combat with Russian tanks. And um, so somebody's using some technology there that people have seen, and there's a number of those stories. But let's go back to the strange conversation and the steganography of Elon and Maxwell for a moment. Maxwell in her cell will start talking not just about a friendly rat, but she'll start mentioning that she's made up an imaginary friend who does all kinds of poltergeisty things like flushes toilets and um, that the friend is named A-17. Now, um, A-17 is also interesting because it's like A-12, but different. But here she is kind of loading out this. And we also know that she mentioned Chernobyl and she mentioned Friendly Rat and these things. But Apollo 17 not only has a Friendly Rat, <laughs> but it is known as A-17. It's also the last mission to the moon, 1972. So... Um, you know, we always talk in relation to Maxwell about the dead man switch that she has. And the reason that she's still alive is because that's so vital. So there's so many interpretations we could use around A-17, the way that she's speaking about it in casual conversation. This is how steganography works. But then we have A-12 operational with Musk. We know that they know each other and they're both using very similar types of steganography. Um, Let's go a little bit further with this. And this one's really weird. So fans baffle after Grimes accidentally reveals surprise, second child with Elon Musk and her unusual name. Grimes, of course, um, is very interesting <laughs> herself in all the things that are going on there. Uh, you know, musically, of course, she's very talented and, and all the rest, but there's all kinds of occult imagery in relation to this. But um, what we have is that the child's name is Exa Dark. <laughs> I instantly mm -hmm. thought dark journalism mm -hmm. and the ex steganography show. Um, but there's a lot of steganography here to work with. Exa Dark Sidereal, which is a type of astrology, by the way, a sidereal astrology. The sun is XAE. A dash, now they're saying it a little different. Instead of saying A dash 12, they're using Roman numerals, A dash X I I. As a new baby sister born via surrogate and her parents called her Y. The existence of the child born in December was accidentally revealed when she started crying upstairs while Grimes was being interviewed. Um, this becomes significant just because of who her uh, baby daddy is. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot to work with here, and some of it is very, it goes deep, but the levels of it, I think, give us a lot to say they're operating with a lot of steganography around these names. And in the conversation, apparently, uh, with Maxwell, she's getting into the type of steganography that you can read between. There's a lot of messaging in it, especially since this was kind of a rare exclusive interview. But A-17 is a weird thing to name a poltergeist ghost. So where is A-17 coming from? And it seems to be related directly to his naming mechanism, A-12. Now here's the weird thing in all of this, <laughs> bringing it all around to Assange and everyone else, is that Grimes, in fact, is rumored to be going out with Chelsea Manning. So Chelsea Manning, of course, is what got WikiLeaks its start because Chelsea gave so many of those files over to Julian, and that's how the whole thing happened. So there's an incredible back and forth going on with this, 
And I think that it gets to the very heart of the individuals we're talking about, the richest man in the world, the woman who was running the Terramar project with Epstein and had all this blackmail material and was doing this really hardcore, um, you know, pimping for the elites and all the rest of it. But we know the story goes very, very deep because her dad was an agent for multiple intelligence agency. For sure she was, for sure Epstein was. When we went through all their pursuits scientifically of these different scientists, we ran across Marvin Minsky and Alexandra Cousteau and all the rest of it in the episode last night. And then we go directly to her conversation about a17, and then his naming his child A-12. The correlations here are happening and they're active. It's not all clear yet what they represent, but they clearly represent something. Interesting. Yes. David James caught something. It's sidereal. Yes. And it's spelled rail, R-A-E-L, right? Isn't there that rail? Sidereal. System? Yes. No, but it's... Oh, like railians? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> railians are kind of like a... Um, a strange alien sex cult. <laughs> so that is kind of funny. Though. That's really that interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting name action. Uh, there's going to be more sort of breaking that down. And I don't like this type of steganography is so interesting because I think it's potent. And um, I don't think those are just happenstance, uh, especially I think her conversation about the prison guards keeping her in these bad conditions and the maggot and the apple, these types of things. Uh, you know, the big apple, of course, is New York where the trial took place. I mean, there's a lot, there's a really a lot in it. And I think the A-17 needs to be explored with that in mind. Uh, but I'll take your next question though. Okay. Um, friends, uh, <laughs> friends, friends. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Steiner to God. Do you think Musk was always part of these secret brotherhoods? Perhaps his rise to prominence was planned all along, or has he been co-opted by them and now serves their agenda? Well, um, I'll tell you that it's hard to get a handle. I, I've been able to get a handle on... Flynn's, uh, General Flynn, and the mystery school he's involved with, which is Elizabeth Clare Prophet's uh, Church Universal and the Summit Lighthouse, uh, because the speech that he gave and got in trouble for was exactly the speech that she gave, conjuring that White Brotherhood, St. Germain activity, I am activity. Um, and it's very interesting, actually, that combination. Bannon, Steve Bannon, who's out there, also has a very deep mystery school connection that we've been able to backtrack and dissect. And it has to do with his proximity to all of these Gurdjieff schools and Gurdjieff training centers when he was in the Navy and how he would make sure he would discover the different locations so he could continue his training. So we have Mystery school, <laughs> uh, graduate number one, Bannon, mystery school, person number two, Flynn. So um, those are have been, you know, it's easy to kind of figure out the links there. And I think that with Trump, we also, um, through Norman Vincent Peale and some of that, we have the new thought type of piece. With Musk, it's very interesting because there's the German aspect there, a South African family, but his family's, uh, you know, they lived in South Africa and Canada, but they're German. And I think that that's where you need to go if you're going to discover that piece. And we know through the work of NIMSA and the early uh, aerospace activities, uh, that is very fascinating because all those groups were German, including uh, you know, the Trump 45 <laughs> information that came out in the, uh, the episodes that we've done. Um, and we did that one episode on NIMSA, well, two episodes actually. So I think that you have to look at the German mystery schools. And what I went to with it was the Tula Society. And I was working with this idea 
and remember again, that's their logo of the Black Sun. But um, the Tula Society had that direct connection with the ET aspect. And I'm not saying that Musk is a Nazi. I'm saying that that um, so many members of the Nazi party were Tula members. But where does the actual school of learning and training go beyond once the party's gone? <laughs> um, the training itself, whatever mystical training was involved with them and their contact with ETs, and the black sun and the ex steganography in the black sun. That is something, and I've been looking uh, at Dr. Farrell's book, of Reich of the Black Sun, to get more on that. So I think that somewhere in there is where we get uh, links for Musk to the mystery schools. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. Whew, we've gone deep, deep now in episode 122, part two. This is the secret space government. Where are they coming from? What is the steganography that's involved? We're going to take some more of your questions. Um, and I also want to remind everyone who's watching to go to the darkjournalist.com website and sign up for our newsletter, which keeps us in touch. And that is something I think that is, uh, you know, with all the incredible kind of meltdowns that we're seeing in the rule of law on these uh, platforms and the incredible censorship that's just off the charts for anything that they don't want people seeing. Uh, we need these different kind of direct pipelines with each other and the newsletter is the best way to do that. And uh, I can guarantee you these types of conversations that are taking place in the dark journalist ideas room, this is what they don't want people doing. <laughs> and that's why, you know, a lot of the social distancing was, Hey, don't, don't talk about important things. Um, but here we are, here we are. Uh, so go to darkjournalist.com and make sure you do that. And Miss Olivia. Mr. Wonderful, DJ, Musk claims to be a free speech absolutist. If his missions to Mars discover the existence of past civilization, do you think he would reveal it to the world? Well, I think that they already know that there's archaeology there and on the moon. Uh, so there was this uh, fantastic guy who he worked, he was part of the Disclosure Project, came out and gave his testimony for them. But he worked for NASA and at one point he realized he didn't have the security clearance to see what he was seeing. But somebody was pointing out to him, oh look, there's a huge like fort type thing on the dark side of the moon. And he looked at all this stuff. And then later his job was to airbrush these things out. Um, so we know there's a history there of good officials after they retired who came out and gave us their stories that they had to change the things that NASA had seen. And so the pictures that we look at, they're all Photoshopped. But there was a point in time where a lot of things were out there. I'm going to point out one that came out. Uh, this is pretty interesting. UFO spotted an old photo from space taken by Apollo astronaut in the 1960s. So there's the shot. And, <laughs> you know, just to show that these things are potent, we just don't know when something is going to come out. Inside there of that photo is this triangle uh, UFO. Now, whether it's this particular picture or a number, there's so many of them, even if this one, if someone didn't think, oh, that's actually legit or whatever. Um, there's so many things like this that there's a period there where NASA doesn't have that incredible clamp down control. There's a portion in the late 70s into the early 80s where there's a program to go back and eliminate all the references to it. So I do believe that there's ancient ruins on these different planets. And it's been referenced by Buzz Aldrin, uh, as we know, that on Phobos, there is an obelisk. So, uh, and that's probably where the whole 2001 story comes around uh, for us that Kubrick directed. So would Musk do it? I think that there's a program that is a not an honest program about what they're going to discover. I think they're going to create a discovery, and that's where uh, Gigi Young's work around Mars is coming in. And she's really ahead of the pack on this, the way that she's uh, looked at the issue. And uh, her recent one on it is really worth watching, as is my interview with Joseph Farrell from November uh, called Mars the Big Lie. These will give you a hint of where they're going with Mars. And remember, Mars is, after all, the god of war in mythology. So if that's the messaging from the elite side, they're going to use it for a war 
like purpose. And uh, they've got the mythology of the Elon from von Braun. So those things don't stack up to me as a bunch of coincidences. They seem to me very much intentional. Yes. Josh Randall, does DJ think it's possible the elites are using energy weapons slash devices on us, influencing our thoughts and well-being? And Joseph Jiba says in the book of Enoch, it says fallen angels came and died, but they remain to wander the earth as ghosts. Does DJ think these noble bloodlines are most likely pawns to these beings? Interesting. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about mind control. <laughs> There's all, I mean, uh, we've talked about voice to skull in the show and, uh, there are all kinds of examples of people who are targeted by different types of things. What I am reminded of is um, the work of Dr. Nick Baggage on HARP. Now, he's gone way beyond HARP now. <laughs> he does so much. But um, one of the things he found out about the patent itself is not only was it based on Tesla technology for HARP, but that one of its applications was to influence the thoughts and emotions of the population. So that means laying out a particular vibration in a particular place to make people feel or think a particular way. So there's no question the technology exists. The question is, how often is it deployed? Um, and, you know, for a while, I was getting all these Chuck E. Cheese videos from uh, Catherine Fitz. And she was saying, this is, you know, the Kingsman technology. And she, she loves those movies. But... Um, this is the idea, which is, you know, when you see these things happen and the Chuck E. Cheese thing was really getting strange. It was like, there are always these massive brawls taking place and they would go viral immediately. Well, um, that seems to me to be test runs of that type of technology. And I think that um, we can realize it by being in tune with it. Not imagine just, oh, you know, cause you feel bad one day that they're using energy weapons on you. That's different. There's a lot of fantasy involved. But I think there are definable ways uh, to do that. And I can tell you from a personal experience, when I think that this was uh, somehow in some way taking place with me, this is a, a, few, a number of years ago, um, that the thing that seemed to snap out of it was acupuncture or mm. chiropractic it seems to change the energy structure alignment of the body. And so whatever it is that's targeting the individual goes haywire and it misses the target. That was my impression of it anyway. Uh, I don't know if it was a, an energy weapon or anything like that, but it sounds similar. It seems kind of similar. That seems to me to be something that would be an interesting solution to try. Um, but there's a whole book on psychic self-defense Um and this is somebody who was Dion Fortune, who was very familiar with the mystery schools. And that book still holds up dramatically. Um, so I think that books like that are very valuable. On the other hand, the more kind of like strange deep state end of the thing, the Havana syndrome and all the things that happened in relation to that, whatever type of technology that is, it follows the individuals because what happened in the case of the Cuban embassy with the American officials is when they came back to America, they continued to experience the symptoms in that case, sound concussions. So, um, you know, there's different levels of this thing. So if you're being targeted by a black magician, <laughs> it's one type of energetic disruption. If you're being targeted by actual directed energy weapons or microwave weapons and things that exist or voice to skull technology, it does exist. This is the thing. And um, it's hard to know literally how to define each. Uh, so, you know, I think that developing a good sense of intuition about these things and, uh, you know, not relying on a fant or fantasy with it but just having a sense for when something is happening. And so often in life, you know, things are so fantastic that you don't need fantasy. <laughs> uh, as we've seen, you know, so many, it's interesting to me, you know, and I always go back to kind of like the Gaia TV whistleblowers and stuff and how they just make up all this stuff. It's interesting because there are real cases that have fantastic, wild things that happen. So 
you know, when we debunk people who are faking on Gaia TV or something, it doesn't mean that we debunk the subject ever. It's just the false use of it. Okay, yeah, go for okay, it. Okay, hold on. I really want to get this, but mm, yes. I scrolled past it, so talk for a minute. Okay, yes. Okay, um, here we go. Brian Kinney. We need to revisit Buzz Aldrin's deleted tweets surrounding his trip to Antarctica. He claimed he was going to launch uh, pad, said, quote, it's all totally evil, unquote, mm. then deleted the tweets. And the temperatures there are very high, as we yes. know right now. Yes. What um, is going on? Well, I remember the tweet. He was like, you know, unparalleled evil or something. We know. And then later they said that somebody pirated his Twitter account. What we A could, likely story. Here's what we know for sure. Why was an experienced astronaut being taken to Antarctica at his age? I think he was close to 90. And then he collapsed there and they had to evacuate him. Um, you know, think about the symbolism. He's an astronaut. Astronauts dealt with what? UFOs. So did they find a UFO? Kerry was there. Um, the, the version of the Russian Pope <laughs> was there. This is what Dr. Farrell told me. And Farrell was so ahead of that you know, that um, he did a series of blogs on it before anybody. And then all the jokers, you know, like from the good gang picked up on it and they kept it going, you know, and it's funny because somebody asked me the other day what I thought of Michael Sella. <laughs> and I don't think much of, of him. And I hate to say that about anyone's work, but I, what I remember <laughs> distinctly because they were like, what about these space arts and things? Like, no, I don't put any, any anything in that because he was saying that Corey Good was part of the Mayan space program, and uh, you know Good was just uh, one of these Gaia uh, TV guys. We went through all kinds of things with Good to prove he was a fraud. But the thing is, um, Sala graduated from there to saying that the reason we had gone into Afghanistan to bomb Afghanistan was to get rid of stasis giants. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, this is interesting, again, because, you know, giants existed in history, and I think their presence in history has been recorded in biblical texts and things like that. And the evidence of it, I think, has been disposed of. That much is true. But the idea that we would go into Afghanistan to bomb stasis giants is ridiculous. So this is where we go. There's so many interesting, fantastic things relating to the esoteric, to UFOs and all the rest of it. And then you have this weird fantasy marketing narratives that run side by side with it. So you have to have that ability to discern even when you're open enough to not just fall into mainstream patterns of thinking. And I think that discernment can be crucial. That's why I have developed dark journalism because it's got the three levels that we talk about, the official story, the secondary story, which is often called the conspiracy theory, but that's really a dark journalism. It's brought forward by professors and writers and researchers who say, hey, there's something wrong with that official story. And then the junk conspiracy, which is so far out, it's supposed to make people on the second level uncomfortable and go back to the official story, go back to sleep. And very often that third level of the story is brought on by the official version folks who want to make it so crazy to believe anything but the official story that they throw this other crazy stuff out there <laughs> like stasis giants okay what else you got uh simone nyman does dj think the new world order will govern from space as a breakaway civilization and the crypto ginger didn't a head of the space force publicly say being the first to the moon militarily will dominate the world um well this is pretty interesting first of all when Trump got into office, uh, there was a big emphasis around going to the moon and going to Mars. And that emphasis was not there under the Obama administration. Obama was obsessed with, you know, bombing Libya and uh, the various uprisings and, and the Obama health care thing, which was the consolidation of people's data, uh, which was crucial for the later things that they were going to try to pull like the COVID op and things of this nature. So we find ourselves in a weird situation when we see suddenly you go from zero to a hundred when you get into Trump 
with the Space Force and everything else. And then they're in a weird situation with the Space Force now because it's basically a Trump organization under a hostile Stepford Biden government. So they don't do much with the Space Force. They're going in other directions. I bet they wish they could just get rid of it because, um, you know, the Stepford Biden committee thing, the thing that's running him from behind, they have no interest in pulling the UFO file back under executive uh, power. They, they're probably quite happy with where it is. Uh, so it's a very interesting question, though. Yes. Uh, Mojo Zoa. Uh, does DJ consider the UFO file is maybe just top tech and the MK Ultra mind control stuff used to hide it and manipulate populations? What uh, what leads you to believe that aliens are real? It's both. That section you just described, which is X technology created and developed by Lockheed Martin outside of the public purview, <laughs> way beyond it, maybe 50 years beyond it. And then... Um, you know, the kind of my lab type experiences of people getting abducted by military officers and them pretending it's an alien abduction and then using MK Ultra type themes. Um, that is a real solid corridor of those types of abduction experiences with aliens. There's no question about it in my mind. However, there is a whole other corridor of what seem like genuine off world visitors visiting here, and some people say it's interdimensional, whatever it might be, and it could be our own uh, future visiting us from the past to the past. Um, you know, there, there are these different pieces, there's no question. However, it seems very obvious that something else is visiting that goes far beyond Lockheed Martin or Boeing or anything like that. And we can't ever, you know, when people are abducted, we have to take it at face value that they're being abducted by something that is alien. Um, and so the imitation of that, the MyLab part of that, does become hard to figure out what's happening there. You know, and I, I mentioned that Betty Andreessen passed away um, yesterday. And uh, her book, The Andreessen Affair, is powerful. I mean, she was from Massachusetts. And the kind of record of abductions that take place and the strange mystical experiences associated it with her and her daughter and eventually her uh, second husband. You know, I mean, those are genuine UFO experiences. They're genuine abduction experiences. And then uh, I can think of cases that make me think of my lab cases, but the thing is they're both operational and that's what you need to keep in mind when you see cases like that, that are like, this is just like an MK Ultra alien thing. You're right. But they're not all like that. <laughs> yes. Jay Mallet, I think Crowley is behind some of the alien activity, especially Roswell and the Philadelphia experiment. Do you want to go into that at all? Philadelphia experiment um, deals with the X technology and the magnetic track and Einstein and altering time and visibility, Project Invisible. So um, I don't think Crowley needs to have anything to do with that. But Crowley definitely seems to be involved very early on with this character, Lamb, who looks very much <laughs> like an alien gray. And he, with Iwas and all these other uh, figures that he's able to conjure. And um, so there's a whole mystical um, black magic world that he is incorporating. Those are beings that are operating on a level that's kind of parallel with us, but it's not something that, um, you know, I think very much about Steiner's work around the Mayans and how there were these aramonic etheric beings, not quite physical, but they're operating in the etheric realm. And so you have to take into a conversation like that some knowledge about the fact that you have a physical body, an etheric double, and an astral body. So the etheric double is something that surrounds in theosophy and anthroposophy, the physical body, and it's an energy body. And the astral body is another piece, like when you dream, you're in your astral body. So these beings, these etheric beings that are influencing Mayan priests and things like that, um, they have incredible powers and knowledge. So there's a whole level that those types of beings exist on. So therefore, um, when we get into that, 
we have to start to, you know, sort out <laughs> what were the positive beings and what were the negative ones. And um, I think what happens is the priesthoods all the way back to Atlantis taught themselves to get into a certain state where they could get into direct communication with these higher beings. And um, I think in the same way that uh, Casey described the two eye stone communication with the priestesses in the temple and all these things that happen, that he said that they're directly in touch with the saintly realm using the technology. And I've made the uh, observation before that it's like opening up your laptop and an ascended master being right there. <laughs> Saint Germain at your beck and call. You know, that's the way that they're using the technology and then somebody else can use it for a totally different reason. So um, it is fascinating. You're dealing with a multitude of different types of influences, but certainly, um, those priesthoods in places like the, you know, the Mayan culture were very sophisticated and understood astrology, astronomy, and the astral realm very well. Yes. Caritasterra.com. Uh, can DJ go over what the rats reference was with Maxwell? Yes. Uh, friendly rats. <laughs> There's a whole story and I might have to do a deeper dive on this for you, but there's a whole story about these mice that stowed away on A-17, Apollo 17, the last mission to the moon. And so friendly rat is also intelligence jargon as well. So um, I feel that you could interpret it a couple of different ways, but I was seeing the reference to A-17 and Apollo 17 and friendly rats directly as part of that moon program aspect, because if you look at Musk using the same type of naming <laughs> nomenclature, A12, you start to get a, a handle that on that level, they're talking about something. In his case, he claims it was a Lockheed Martin advanced uh, jet. And in her case, she's just making it up, you know, um, and it's poltergeist though, it's like a ghost, right? Which is a weird thing for her to be saying in prison anyway. I mean, doesn't that qualify her for a psychological exam? <laughs> um, so she's taking a big risk there saying A17, I've nicknamed this thing and it, you know, it does all this stuff, it spooks the guards and all that stuff. What is she talking about? Uh, it seems to me like coded conversation, hence steganography. So um, the friendly rats, I think is directly related to Apollo 17. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I'm sure it goes deeper and I'm, I'm going to study the conversation more, but yes, go ahead, go for it. Well, you know, a lot of people are like, cry me a river, you know, but mm. you know, we don't, I don't want to be a part of a civilization that condones torture and, no. you know, for anybody, anybody yes. and, um, you know, never turn the lights off you know, it's horrible. And um, cause we know that lack of sleep dements you very quickly. Um, so. No question. Um, she absolutely could be being treated that way as a way to break her down. And uh, here's a good question. Rehoboth Farm says, why did they publish what Maxwell said? That's a good question. Mm, why telegraph that? Yes. <laughs> Oh, there's no question about it. Well, um, I think that since we have it on the record, it is, it's worth studying what she's saying, what the actual context is, and then just pulling the words out and doing kind of extrapolating out what that is, what they are individual and sort of shredding the conversation and putting it back together. Um, I feel very much that uh, the ghost aspect is important as well. And, uh, you know, there's a whole thing about ghosts of the air as well, which is always involved. It goes all the way back to Lindbergh when he was crossing the Atlantic and all these incredible spirits start yelling in his ear. They're with him, you know, and he's experiencing basically like disembodied astral voices. Um, well, it also happens that a lot of astronauts you know, they don't always report this because it makes them sound crazy, but a lot of astronauts experience voices and things that float into them at a certain point. And 
um, you know, Armageddon, war in the air. There's a whole thing about spirits of the air, which is not something that this culture, uh, you know, is open to, but native cultures, for example, are very familiar with this idea. So um, the idea of a ghost uh, <laughs> in space, you know, and I remember Jim Mars telling me very, very strange story about how there was a Roswell ghost. And it was because right. there's a nurse who told the story about uh, this alien that they had there and the alien died. And uh, she had been the nurse and the doctors didn't know what to do with this thing that was dying. And they took the body away and everything else. And then she would see it. It would just show up. And it, it had a tendency to scare the hell out of the nurses there for years. There was this ghost of a gray hanging out. Yes. I, that's a weird story. <laughs> yeah. We have to watch this. Actually, Red Cap Goblin says the secret of Nim was about an evil genetically created psychic rat overlord, if I remember right. <laughs> there, that's oh, that's, that's a loaded film. Yes. Yes. There's a lot in there. Um, okay. I love this question. Pat Kelly, who brought the moon here? Well, I know there's a lot of different speculation about this. I will say that in Steiner's work, the moon came out of the earth. And uh, that when it left, there was a certain period where uh, the harmonic force came in during the part when the moon was still in our atmosphere. And um, so that's a lot of cosmology. The official version of how the moon got here is really funny. Have you ever read it? It's absurd. I mean, they're just like, oh, we think the moon just came barreling in and smashed against the earth and started to be in its orbit. I mean, and then, um, so all the different theories about the moon, it, it doesn't really add up very well. So um, I feel that what Steiner is saying is that this is how the moon developed out of the earth and then became its satellite, you know, um, but I think it's worth, you know, there's a whole number of things about how the moon doesn't turn and, and all the rest of it that make it very unusual and the idea that we captured something. I do want to say that in Casey's work, he talks about a planet that's no longer there that had been destroyed and that if we understood the calculations of the galaxy and just made account for the fact that there used to be a planet there in the track of uh, this system, and that it had been destroyed, then we would understand, you know, a lot of things would make, like the asteroid belt would make more sense to us. So the Giza Death Star books that Joseph Farrell does pursue that kind of line of thinking, not in reference to Casey, but so there's something there about a planet that got destroyed. And um, a lot of people have said that Star Wars itself was influenced by this planet destroying um, story based on the fact of, of these things, because remember Star Wars is, even though it's futuristic, is supposed to have taken place in a galaxy far, far away a long, long time ago. So um, that's pretty interesting, but there's always been these hints that George Lucas, and uh, you know, this is something that Richard Hoagland really gets into, but that George Lucas was clued in with these groups. Who, that's where he heard these stories and he incorporated it directly into star wars all right two more questions miss olivia okay red cap goblin can someone please ask putin to release russia's ufo files since he has nothing left to lose by doing so <laughs> excellent point um no i'm sure he's holding on to every card and every advantage that he can what he can do perhaps is i think that he's holding things politically that could be explosive for example satellite photos of 9 11 <laughs> uh, information regarding the Kennedy Man, assassination. Man, that's a good idea. Interesting, isn't I it? I love it, yes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Putin is in a strange position, and um, I think that uh, that's someone who really needs to reflect on the actions that they're taking also. They're all involved in such a way for domination. And so, you know, whether it's Ukraine, Russia, the World Economic Forum, you know, there's a there's a game that's playing out here, and we need to get aware of the game beyond just the typical news stories, you know, and like I said, Zelensky's a hero and Putin's the villain and all that stuff. And the way that we can do that is through good reporting. 
So when you look at the CIA influence there involved in Ukraine, what have they been doing there? What's their goal? What's their mission there? Um, have they been creating this scenario thinking Russia won't be able to take us on? This is the perfect opportunity. Um, you know, but it's dangerous be for a number of reasons because war is always dangerous and all that could backfire. And so Putin launching an action like that is very dangerous for himself as well. So if anything, you just hope <laughs> these people who are overplaying the game would pull back. Um, but um, right now, I think we're deep in the throes of it. So yeah, excellent question. Yes. Jordan Banner, where is all this going if it's a rerun of the Melius versus Belial group, another catastrophe? Well, this is interesting because this is what Casey said a number of the Atlanteans had reincarnated for the ability to face the situation again and do the right thing. Um, but I would say this, that um, Emilius in the Casey readings is basically the Christ figure. And the idea is he wants the culture to move forward. He wants the people to spiritually develop, et cetera. And he develops the technology based on that. And it gets abused by the Belial group. So we have a lot of parallels in that a number of people just want to kind of move through their lives and raise their children and develop and uh, develop their talents and their lives and their families. And there's another group that is set and it seems like every year they become more thirsty um, and reckless. They're set on squeezing humanity and harvesting humanity and dominating humanity. And, um, so I think that those the balance of that is fascinating. And I think that the Belial Amelius struggle that Casey lays out, which is very much like the Steiner Araman uh, Christ Golgotha struggle, you know, these are the thing, these it's the same kind of forces at work. Uh, I think Steiner was really onto something for the 21st century, talking about Araman coming through the technology. And that would be kind of the real battle for humanity and that humanity couldn't be caught unawares. That's the real um, kind of beauty of spiritual science of Rudolf Steiner, I think, that it gives us so much by letting us know that this is happening. Because if you look, and I've pointed this out before, but theosophy gives us that track that, well, the next root race is gonna be psychic and people are all gonna be telepathic, things are gonna be great. And, you know, these cultures will learn to live together and all the rest of it. And they kind of skip the big <laughs> Aramon battle piece. Um, so, you know, they, they're very optimistic, I think, in that sense. But um, Steiner is like, look, you know, the possibilities are great, but you have this big Aramonic incarnation and you're smashing right into it in the 21st century. So that's why I think the Steiner work is so vital in this period, especially since he predicted it would take a hundred years around for these ideas to really open up. And he said that in 1920. So here we are. <laughs> Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. We're wrapping up here uh, this episode. Amazing questions. Thank you so much. We're going to take one more and then um, we're going to wind it down. Go for it. Uh, we have almost 3,000 people. <laughs> we should just keep going. That's fantastic. Okay, Bobo the Clown. Um, how can we humans create our own personal technology that can override the influences of the military space control grid, which seems to surround us? This is a great question for Gigi. I know you're going to be interviewing her soon. Yes. Oh, no question. Uh, we'll have her on shortly. And um, no, look, the opportunities are there. I'm going to kind of go back around with your question, but just to use for an example, in this time period, um, I feel like there are open periods where windows open and people need to seize the opportunity. So, you know, in one period you had the Steiner work, you had the Gurdjieff work with Aspensky, and all that period runs from Blavatsky to when they die from 1875 to 1950. That's a 75 year period. And in that period you get Casey's work, you get um, Steiner, Gurdjieff, Blavatsky, um, you know, Annie Passant, all the rest. So it's an incredible opportunity with incredible people that come through. And then you have this other period, which is almost like a follow-up period 
and things are sort of moving through the culture and you have interesting people, but even with like um, Elizabeth Clare Prophet and stuff, it doesn't have the same power of those other groups, although it's very interesting continuation of the ideas and things like that. Um, and then after Gurdjieff, you have Bennett's assistant, JJ, you know, uh, Gurdjieff's assistant, Bennett, doing, you know, a version right up until the mid 70s. And then the Gurdjieff work kind of goes underground. So um, I think what happens is there's cycles for it. So right now, I think there's a cycle of time. We're talking right here about the ex degenography ideas, the mystery schools, and the legacy that they have left. We have people out there that are phenomenal in terms of, uh, you know, just think on, on so many different levels, like RFK Jr. in relation uh, to the legal cases around this incredible medical tyranny that's going on. Um, and, you know, Catherine Austin Fitz has given us the missing trillions and all these different ideas about building a new world, really. Gigi Young, um, just remarkable. Her mystical work is is phenomenal. I could go on about it. Uh, Alexandra at Forbidden Knowledge TV and all of her political reporting. I can tell you that, and Joseph Farrell's work, Giza Death Star, these are uh, very interesting things that are coming together, and I'm seeing more of them, uh, Alana Freeland's work. And these things weren't really available the way that they're available right now. I think they've all come together at this particular time. And so that you know, we have this opportunity here with each other right now, even in this conversation going through this, we have the things that we can build upon, you know, the incredible shoulders that we stand on, the work of uh, people like Casey and the movements and things. So we have an opportunity to do something new and really learn uh, from this while still apprehending this modern society and using all the tools that it offers to do that, which is going to do things a little bit differently um, than the traditional society at large. And so there's that wonderful phrase, which is don't leave the world, the world will leave you. It's kind of true in a sense. So that's really the way that I see that. And with that, Miss Olivia? I'm going to actually let Najat have the last question. <laughs> yes. How do we bring more light to the dark? <laughs> Uh, well, it's attunement, right? It's always attunement. And then the Casey formula was always very interesting to me. It's attunement and service. So, but um, you have to be able to see. And in order to be able to see, you need to be able to attune. So I would say it's about tools for attunement. Attunement. And Actually, that, can we talk about this a little bit more? Yes. Because it's, you know, in spiritual literature, they always talk about sort of enlightened beings having that attunement where when you like a tuning fork, you get around them and you start to elevate your vibration. You start to become attuned to them, right? There's a transmission that takes place. Um, yes. So what do we have control over really? Only ourselves, right? But most of us don't actually take that challenge on uh, as thoroughly as we should. We hit on this a little bit yesterday. And in all the ways that we can, you know, treating our bodies as a temple, being really responsible for what we take in in our minds. You know, we are what we eat. That includes what we take in on the internet, you know, what we watch, um, all of that. No, if it, light begins with us, right? So that's, it's not about trying to change your brother in law, you know, and get them <laughs> to see things differently, you know. It really is about doing our own work and raising our own vibration. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and really taking on as a sacred task. Well, it always starts with you. I, what's interesting, uh, I think about the Ospensky work and Ospensky's interpretation of Gurdjieff's work. And one of the things that he was talking about in terms of someone who was really worried about the war conditions that were going on, and I always think it's interesting because he went through the Russian Revolution, World War I, and then World War II. And there were people who were in the work of Gurdjieff work who were coming to him and saying, I don't know if we're going to be able to do things with all these conditions going on, you know, like the war conditions and all the panic and everything else. And he said something very interesting. He said that the work that you do on yourself may actually change the conditions 
conditions that so it's also your perception of it so the reality itself might change if you work on yourself that's very interesting does that mean you, you transport to a different level of living um there's a lot in there that's the psychology of man's possible evolution i do feel when we look at these things um it's not the idea of a formula really is just a guide that there's lots of formulas you know and sometimes they're contradictory <laughs> you ever had some of those where somebody says you need to show your anger more and other mm -hmm. people are like hey you need to control your temper <laughs> um you know it's all a balance of all these different types of things so the formula is always flexible i think it's a moving diagram but uh fundamentally i think it's true that it starts with you there's no question about that and we've seen that over the course of time of doing this program where when we brought forward these ideas it's an interesting echo that we got back from people. There's a kind of a cycle of realization about things from people in the ideas room from the things that we were studying and bringing forward. So now that's part of a larger conversation and it gains kind of a magnetism and a magnitude. Um, so we find ourselves <laughs> opening up a number of conversations at once. And that's what we're uh, definitely here to do. And we've been doing it tonight a lot. So thank you so much for your excellent questions uh, tonight on this. There's so much more to do on Musk and all the rest. And I promise we're gonna, that's exactly what we're gonna do. But Miss Olivia, you're up. Okay, I have so many super chatters to thank. Um, <laughs> Gil and Joy R, Eurythmy is fun. Joe Dirt, Ghost in the Machine, Plato Always New, Jim Sarge 3ID, Melody Lenz, Jamie Linton, Shiny Gee, Jay Le Liebgott, Roosevelt Media News, Erica Swenson Elliott, Zach Boyles, Doreen Hewitt, uh, Valiant Bran, uh, Global Atlantis, Steve Vaughn, Geo Hiker, Daryl Dathero, uh, WC Ray, Sean Juck, uh, Medley Childress, Lee Schwuchow, uh, Sammy Dawes, Nacreous 3.7, Bobo the Clown, Bob Bindert, Brian Kinney, Brian Storm, Mark Lane, Tony Ark, Chris Cicella, Luke Walker, uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for your generous support of the show. Unbelievable. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And uh, it's extraordinary support that you've shown us there in the chat uh, in the Ideas Room tonight. And to all our subscribers, thank you, because uh, you allow us to go forward and do this extraordinary work with you. And uh, I can guarantee you we have such amazing things coming up here in the next month or two that... Um, you're going to want to be on board for that. Make sure that you're there at darkjournalist.com and signed up for our newsletter. Also, uh, to subscribe to the site, be part of the things that we have going forward. There are extraordinary uh, interviews and shows coming up for you. We'll be back with the X series in April, and we're coming, uh, we'll be doing a show. Uh, you know, we have interviews and special reports and all kinds of things coming up for the rest of March. And then come April, we're back with X123. And I can guarantee you <laughs> some really mind blowing stuff. I'm doing a couple of shout outs here. Thomas Tyson, it's great to see you. Oh, right, I can do all that. The last interview with Alana Freeland. Yes, wasn't she? her work is extraordinary. Geoengineered, I have the book right over here, Geoengineered Transhumanism, a remarkable piece of work. It's 600 pages, so get ready, folks. Um, Michael Snow, it's great to see you. Great show. Jay Mallet, thank you so much. Al Kider, how are you, sir? Wally Tango Foxtrot, you got it. Tiffany Sherry, wow, excellent to see so many people. A great crowd tonight in the Ideas Room for part two of 122, our four year anniversary of doing the X series. I'm so excited for year number five, and I can't picture doing anything else. So, <laughs> uh, Golden Girl, it's great to see you. Green Queen, God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you as well. Mr. Wonderful, hey, isn't that my name? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's superb as always. Thank you, Mr. Wonderful. Deborah Sloan, great to see you. John, the home repair specialist. Najat, it's great to see you. Thanks for being out there. I know Kate's out there. It's great to see you. Gigi, of course. 
thanks for being with us. Carolyn Goida, Kat Goida, thank you so much. Thank you for your help as well. Astro Sam, my main man, right? <laughs> Sarcastic Warlock, that's a great title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's face it. And uh, bravo, Miss Olivia, nice. Thank you. I, you know, I just wanted to say a shout out to the Ideas Room. Um, I wanted to reassure you, DJ goes through the chat every single show, line by line, um, for ideas, you know. Um, and every and every email. Even if I don't respond to every email, mm -hmm. I read them all. <laughs> and um, including your fan mail, by the way. <laughs> And um, I just, I wanted to thank everybody out there because um, these last four years have been amazing and I'm so grateful for all of you. Yes, we really appreciate uh, all your support and incredible ideas and the incredible conversation that we're having. And um, the way I look at it, we're all sort of, uh, you know, engaging in these ideas together. And it's something as a group we're discovering things. And I've discovered remarkable things. Chrissy, it's great to see you out there. Thanks so much for being with us. I hope we you're are, doing well. I just want to say we are resources for each other. I can, you know, I'm, I make notes during the show about things I need to look up on the internet that people are sharing yes. books. I need to read, you know, documentaries. So it's amazing. <laughs> it is. It's great. It really is an incredible resource that you just can't get anywhere else. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about it. We have some exciting shows coming up for you uh, in April for the X series and some very interesting special reports for the rest of March. So thank you very much. And we will see you all next Friday at 8 p.m. Uh, so appreciate it. If I missed anybody, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to get as many of you in at the last minute as Paul Pumphrey Gooch. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Rainforest. Roosevelt. It's great to see you, sir. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Happy Hermit. <laughs> Another great name. <laughs> you can't beat that. Bud Zeppelin. I like it. Fantastic. Um, so, so much about space coming up and watch for space in the Ukraine, because this is going to be a major piece, I think, going forward. And we're seeing so much of that. And remember, around Ukraine and these stories that they're pushing out there, don't believe the hype. And we can always get to the deeper story on this stuff. And uh, I do hope that the people in Ukraine do get some real relief from the tyrants on all sides. And unfortunately, there are no good guys on that particular front, but maybe some will show up that we're not aware of. Karen Carpenter. Thank you so much. Love the symbiosis. Yes, you got the right idea. <laughs> we will see you all next week and have a great uh, weekend, the rest of the weekend, everyone. Thanks, Ms. everybody. Olivia, last word for you. Actually, there's a, this is pretty funny. Michael Snow said, hat tip to the XFAM member that coined this when someone said the earth was flat. Quote, impossible. If that were true, the cats would have knocked everything off the edge. <laughs> That's right. I love that. Spoken like a true cat lover. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And you know, it says end broadcast after all. It never really ends. And we'll see you next week.